Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, I'm thrilled to be joined with the award-winning audiobook producer, director, narrator and so much more, Neil Gardner. Neil, thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? I'm really well. I've not been in a club for a long time, so this is really exciting. <laughs> I've been in rooms and I've been in Zooms, but now we're in a club. So, hey, we get badges. <laughs> oh, I wish. I hope so. I'm still reaching out for T-shirts. So oh, I'd maybe... wear a T-shirt in a second. Yeah, you get them sorted and I'll be your first person. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> no, if we may, I'd love to start right at the very beginning. Can you tell us a little about your background, how you got started in the world of audio and audiobooks? Yeah, sure. It goes back quite a long way. I'm what most people would call quite an old fart now. Uh, I'm com- coming up to my 48th birthday soon, and, and when I hit that, I would have been working officially for 35 years since I was 13. Oh, wow. Uh, I did my first work for BBC Radio Bedfordshire as a volunteer back back then, and then only a couple of years later, I got my first paid job, so it's like 33 years since my first money for working in radio came around. Oh, wow. So it's all they ever wanted to do, much to my school's disgust. They wanted me to go off and become a teacher or a botanist or something. It's like, no, I want to work in media. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I only ever wanted to work in radio uh, and audio, uh, anything with headphones, speakers, microphones. I, I, I was a Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi, sorry. I was a hi-fi nerd back in the day. My dad used to hate me playing with all his equipment and fiddling with all the knobs and sliders <laughs> and things. And looking back now, he had every right to. That was a really expensive hi-fi kit that I was mucking about with, pretending <laughs> like the faders were the, were, were the controls on the Star Trek Enterprise and stuff. But, but, <laughs> yeah. but he never stopped encouraging me to, to play with the equipment and, and learn what, and, and love music. So I, when I finally had the chance to move on and, and not go to university, I, I actually went to become uh, to do a sound engineering course because uh, I just knew I wanted to work somewhere with sound. And there weren't any, back then, this is the early 90s, there weren't any qualifications for radio or television or media. There just weren't any. So I found a sound engineering course run via uh, Kingston University, uh, a very difficult to get on one. There was something like 15,000 applicants for 30 places. Wow. Uh, and you had to yeah. fund it yourself. It was something like £25,000 for the year. Uh, yeah. So it was like beg family and friends to lend me money and then hope I get in. I got in. I did the course. It was called Gateway um, and learned to be a sound engineer. And what I decided, everyone else in the course wanted to then go and be a recording engineer, you know, a music engineer. Yeah. I took my little bit of paper and went knocking on radio station doors and went, I'm different from anyone else who's knocking on your door because I've got a bit of paper. <laughs> and it worked. So Chiltern Radio back up in Bedfordshire uh, took me on as a, as a junior tech, basically. Yeah. And I used to run the overnight shows. So when the DJs didn't want to be there, they'd do all their links onto a quarter-inch tape and they'd have £2 an hour tech ops, as we were called. Uh, it cost me more to get there and go home than I actually ever <laughs> earned. But we basically did the show in, in all but voice. You know, we play. Mm. So I did that for a few years and sort of mucked around and, and eventually got into management and DJing and presenting and producing, working with like some of the greats from, from 70s and 80s radio who had moved into commercial radio. A lot of the famous Radio 1 DJs were now there. Um, mm. So you, I learned to produce live these people like Emperor Roscoe. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul Burnett and um, just so many of them. It was such a good time to learn. And then from there, I bounced across. I, I did a lot of radio station work, uh, mm. mostly as a presenter, but also became a head of music. And then I became, I think I was the, at the time, the country's youngest head of music and then the youngest program controller working out of KLFM in Kings Lynn. And, you know, it's all very, you know, digital radio, North Norfolk, Alan Partridge stuff. But... <laughs> But it's the yeah. best way to learn because you get to choose the music, play the music, talk about the music and then learn about people's lives. You know, local community and commercial radio is such a good place to learn, um, yeah. not just technologically, but just about how people respond to things, mm. which you know, has been useful going later on in my life. So from there, I, I bounced around various jobs, um, did a bit of Capital, did a bit of Virgin, uh, did a bit of Radio One. Um, yeah. It's a difficult industry, radio. You do tend to jump around an awful lot and follow the jobs. Uh, yeah. But finally, uh, this job came up, at the for- bizarrely, via the Foreign Office, working for this organisation called the London Radio Service. And this was like a late 90s version of propaganda, for want of a better word. Uh, yeah. This was 97. Tony Blair just got in. We got this period called Cool Britannia. Everything about Britain needs to be promoted to the world. So the London Radio Service, alongside a television version called the British Satellite News I think 
were tasked out of Camden, Camden Lock, like the funkiest place in London at the time. I mean, my <laughs> Lord, my brain exploded when I started working there. Um, we were tasked with producing all this very positive British, uh, I suppose you'd call it media, entertainment, pop culture news. And yeah. so uh, I was brought on as the uh, head engineer and, and sort of technical producer. And we make these 10 programs a week, uh, five of them, six of them in English, and then the rest would be there's one in Russian, one in Portuguese, one in Spanish, one in Arabic. And so I would oversee the production of all 10 programs with these specialist producers who'd come in. They'd be hired from like World Service. And yeah. uh, we shared a building with like it was this incredible building in, in Camden Lock where all the international television stations had their London offices. So if you needed someone to do a story on Brazil, you could pop down the corridor and find Paula, who was like the head reporter in London for Brazilian TV, and bung her a tenor and say, could you pop in the <laughs> studio and <laughs> do us a quick bit on, on, on this story? And my Lord, I've got to say, as a young man, that was an awful yeah. lot of fun to be had with, uh, with, with a lot of international reporters in Camden Lock in the evening. Yeah. Um, I don't think oh, I got gosh. home before about 2 a.m. most nights. It was a, it was a crazy 18 months. But again, it was like learning how to produce and technically produce and understand stories in different languages mm -hmm. was an amazing moment. And yeah, I'm in my early 20s. I mean, I'm in the throbbing heart of, of, of entertainment London. It was a blast. Uh, but after 18 months, I was, I was headhunted by this company called Labrick Audio. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, back then, it was called Labrick Productions. And it was the very first UK independent radio production company. So uh, it was formed in 1975 by two of the original uh, staff members of LBC. So LBC oh, right. is, uh, originally was London Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the first UK independent commercial radio station. Uh, and two of the members of staff there, basically the, the arts correspondents, uh, were spending so much time training people to do interviews. They thought, oh, we could launch a company which basically trains people to do interviews which became this thing called a syndicated tape service. So back before we had ISDN lines and Wi-Fi and everything else, if, yeah. uh, say, an author wanted to tour all the radio stations in the country but couldn't afford to, they'd come to somewhere like Labrook and be interviewed. They'd be trained, then they'd be interviewed, but the questions would be removed and the tapes would be sent out. They'd be syndicated and the presenters at the local stations could drop in their own version oh, of right. the question as yeah. though so they you know, they literally start with oh and joining me can't believe they've come all this way from london all the way up to wherever it is that i am in local fm land you know yeah. and so you know they'd have a script and they could record and edit them it, they later came out on cd and um oh, wow. yeah yeah it was an interesting business model but when uh, margaret thatcher decided in the late 80s i believe it was might have been the early 90s to allow the BBC to start opening itself up to independent television production actually changed the law and made it so that 50% of BBC television had to be made by independent companies radio naturally needed to follow BBC radio with its national networks but they were kind of uncertain about how to do it so instead of making it a law they kind of made it a a voluntary thing for BBC radio to do let's let's have a go see how it works Interestingly, it coincided with a moment where they also sacked a lot of their in-house yeah. producers. So it's like, oh, we've got a ready market of people who know how to make BBC things. But interestingly, Labrook, because they've been around for so long doing commercial radio, and a lot of the people they worked with were BBC people, got the first commission to make the first ever drama for BBC Radio. It actually went out on BBC World Service in 1995, and it's called Burkhoff's Macbeth. So it's Stephen Burkhoff, the great wunderkind. Uh, <laughs> him, an amazing cast. I've got pictures in the studio. It's an amazing cast. Still sounds great today. Um, and they produced that, and then th that company rolled on. So they actually split off that media training wing. Uh, that phrase we all know, media training today, is very political. Well, yeah. they were the first media training company. It was called Electric Airwaves. Still exists to this day. And so they split that off, and the parent company kept doing media training, but Labrick Productions continued making BBC Productions. Yeah. So they came and headhunted me in 1999, and they said, we need someone to come take over, run our studios, but also potentially we kind of got this, this career structure for you. We know you've never made BBC stuff. We know you want to. So it's really hard as a, as a non... Let's put it this way. I don't have a degree in arts or anything like that. So to try and get into yeah. the BBC as a producer without an arts degree, basically never going to happen. I tried and tried and tried, never got in. 
So this was a route in. If you could get a commission as an independent, the BBC yeah. really weren't bothered what your background was, just can you make the program? So Labra could be making programs for years. So suddenly it was like, oh, I'm going to get a good salary. I'm going to have this exciting central London job. I get to make all this cool stuff and a career path which might lead me to being a producer at the BBC. No brainer, obviously. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I jumped in. I went there. And yeah, it was like lots of tedious running a studio stuff that any engineer listening will understand. It's like, it sounds magical from the outside, but on the inside, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, get a taxi at 4.30, start the shift at 6, end at midnight. It's like, <laughs> but over the nine years I was there, I quickly went on to become the uh, creative director of the company. Mm. I became the executive producer of all our BBC output. We went on to produce up to 30 different things a year across all the national BBC and international BBC networks, including yeah. drama, documentaries, readings, produ all sorts of productions. Mm. And we were in the top mm. five indies for many years. Uh, but then in 2008, they decided the parent company that just didn't want to play with the BBC anymore. It wasn't making much money. So they mm. sold it to me and I became the owner of Labrick Productions. And the first thing I did was I looked at the books and went, we need to make more money. Audio books have been a side project for the company for many years uh, as a studio. So I just rang up all the people that used to hire the studio and said, out of interest, would you actually like us to just do the whole thing? Be your London people. Back then, yeah. BBC Audiobooks was pretty much the biggest provider in the country. It's nothing like it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and they were based in Bath. And they had their own studios, but a lot of talent, a lot of big famous people would be in theatre in London. So they'd have their days free. So they'd have to send these producers up from Bath. Well, hang on a second. I, I live in South London. I could just pop in and do it for you. And it was like, oh, suddenly audiobooks became the big thing in my life. And which is yeah. really odd because uh, previous to that, like, yeah, yeah, audiobooks, they're fine. You know, you don't really bother with them. Just knock them out and make it happen. But suddenly yeah. it became this big business. And very quickly, the BBC saw, because I had this background in science fiction and fantasy on the BBC, well, maybe I'd like to take over the Doctor Who stuff for them. Uh, the London-based Doctor Who stuff. Okay, that's great. And then suddenly it's like, oh, you get on quite well with celebrities, don't you? Do you want to do like celebrity biographies and memoirs and stuff? So, well, depends who the celebrity is, but yeah, okay, right, fine, yeah. So, so then you get a reputation for like being good with celebrities. Yeah. Uh, and then it just kind of steamrolled until finally in 2013, we stopped making stuff for the BBC, just financial difficulties mm. uh, with, with commissioning um, and went full audiobooks. And I changed Labrick Productions to Labrick Audio for very boring accounting reasons, uh, which don't really matter here. Uh, <laughs> and since then, uh, we built our own studios in Croydon, which is where I used to live until a year ago, and they're still there. And we ramped up to the point where we're at now. We've got two studios, and we do about 150 to 200 audiobooks a year. Uh, yeah. Massive uh, clients like Penguin Random House, uh, uh, as well as uh, Belinda, uh, Bonnier, Harper, BBC, obviously, we still do all their Doctor yeah. Who stuff for them. Uh, pretty much all the major um, publishers, her, um, Hachette, uh, Hachette Kids, which is great fun, as you can imagine. Uh, I yeah. love Orion Galantz, Paul at Orion Galantz, you know, me and him, we can be down the pub for hours talking science fiction. <laughs> oh, we're such dorks at time, I tell you. Um, but it's so much fun. And so that's where we're at. We've kind of, we've kind of, I've kind of gone from being doing massive amounts of audio to going down to this very specific thing. Yeah. Um, including, but we still do audio drama. And, you know, I spent four or five years also being a sound designer and director for Big Finish on their stuff mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so we've kind of encapsulated it into a we love audiobooks and anything that's kind of on the edges of audiobooks. And as you can hear, I'm rather passionate about it because I it's, love making yeah. audio. <laughs> that's fantastic. What a fascinating journey um, for both yourself and Ladbrook. Um, that is really, really incredible. I'm, I have a million questions to ask. I know, um, you probably do. This will be like a four-hour <laughs> podcast, but go for it, whatever. So um, I, I really want to come back to talking about Doctor Who, as I'm, uh, I don't know yeah, uh, if you please. can imagine, but um, uh, I've, uh, I've got everything pieced together. Um, first of all, I'd love to start um, talking about uh, your experience with directing. I'd love to know about your um, your process, how it might look while prepping an audiobook, how it is having uh, you know a narrator or an actor come into the studio, the things that is expected of you, um, maybe some sort of top tips of, you know, you say that you develop this reputation of being very good around um, actors and maybe some uh, challenging circumstances that we can all imagine. Can you just tell us a little bit about that experience uh, and your, your process? Yeah, sure. So I kind of got quite lucky because throughout my career I've 
I happen to be in places where big talent is. Yeah. Um, I wish it paid as well as their talent was recognised, but you know what I mean. You never mind. Yeah. You know, technical yeah. people never get paid well. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> but because they're there and you know they're amazing people, but they come with challenges. It could be their time, their schedule, their ego, their their entourage, the expectation. Uh, so. Yeah, you know, even back to being like an eighteen-year-old technical operator, like the expectation that you learn about, it, it was really important to me. So then, when I got into making uh, programs full time, and particularly making dramas and readings, where it's about mm-hmm. acting talent, mm-hmm. I don't come from a theatre background like a lot of traditional directors and producers do in that field. So I had to call upon, I suppose you call it man management background you know when you work in commercial radio you know everyone's on six month contracts they're all looking to stab each other in the back it's all about (laughs) who's going to get the breakfast show who's going to get the evening show you know there's a lot of politics going on as there are in all offices of course but it's layered with talent and and lots of other things so i i thought well yeah i i know what i know and i know what i like and i know how to ask people what I like but what I needed to do is lean on that man management experience of running radio stations which is what I've done um so when it comes to let's have a think about this okay let's talk about audiobooks rather than audio dramas because they're mm-hmm. a very different thing but we can talk about those as well mm-hmm. so with audiobooks the main thing and I say this time and time again to anyone I speak to about this is a, if you're in a traditional studio modern studio environment where you it's it's a narrator and one person that one person is me so me i am the uh, i am the engineer so i'm making sure the buttons are pressed uh, i'm also the producer in the uk we use the term producer in the way that americans use the term director um, i'm trying to change that over here as a few other people are so we're trying to get the term director used more because producer normally means the person who organizes the session and deals with money and contracts it's a little confusing Mm. but if we just use the phrase producer director it will it will save a lot of uh, problems internationally so you're also the producer director so they're your two paid jobs but actually i think your job is to be the cheerleader your job is to make sure when that person comes in through that door, whether they've done 100 audiobooks or it's their first audiobook, you're there to go, brilliant, I'm so excited you're here. This is going to be a fun time. You're going to be relaxed. You're going to enjoy yourself. But if anything goes wrong, if you have any slips or something's wrong in your life, if you're a bit stressed or your tummy's hurting, whatever it is, I'm here to help you. I'm here to cheer you on and get you through it and help you over those stumbles. I'm not here to get upset with you i'm not here to tell you off even if i have to come on the talk back and tell you you've got something wrong i'm not doing it out of frustration i might be but actually <laughs> you, you, know, you don't want to see what i might be saying in the background when the talk back's off but you know if from your perspective as a narrator your producer slash engineer slash director whatever you call them hmm. should be your your cheerleader your best friend and also and this is a really important thing your first listener so if you can't get your head around, put it this way, when you work in, in live radio, you're always told that even though you might be broadcasting to say 100,000 people, broadcasters are you're talking to one. Mm. It's kind of weird. It doesn't quite work because you, you're generally just talking about music. You know, it's quite, and that's quite an impersonal thing. So actually it's better to think about talking to say a pub full of people. You know, it's like it projects slightly. But with yeah. audiobooks, you really should think about, this is how I always put it, you're down the pub, your best friend since your childhood years has come back from a long long trip you've not seen them for like a year they've come back and and you've been reading this book and you really want to tell them about this book but in fact they say tell you what just just read the book read the book to me if you can get in your mind that that's what you're doing that the person listening is someone who you really care about who who and genuinely wants to hear this wants to hear you and wants to hear the book that's the best approach to it. That way you can get over your nerves about, oh my God, 100,000 people might hear me reading this. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. You're never going to meet them, so it's not going to matter. And you know, as long as you never read the reviews of an audiobook, you're pretty much going to be safe in your mental space. Uh, but yeah, approach it that way. And my job is to make sure that happens. And that comes down to everything. So when I'm teaching people about this, it's, it's about, for example... And this isn't perfect. You can't do this every time. But for example, we try our best at Labbrook never to let people see behind the scenes. And what we mean by that is a little phrase between myself and Morrison, my my other producer, is that we try to make sure that all the stuff like setting up the teas and coffees, getting the biscuits out, doing the hoovering, making sure the cushions are plumped up, you don't see any of that. You might see it in the middle of the day. We would pop back out for lunch and we're just making. But the kind of setup, 
unless there's some mistake with with timing in the morning and everyone arrives at the same time because of train travel problems we want it so when you walk through the door it's like one cup of tea one cup of coffee whatever it might be you know yeah. the place is look it's re- i don't want you thinking about this how the room got to how it got to a lot of other places don't do that. I mean, they'll do the cleaning and everything, you know, outside, but they'll almost like be doing set up. They'll download scripts. They'll have, no, 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 no. When you walk into my booth, the script's there ready to go. You know, the glass of water's there ready to go. The pencil's there ready to go. You know, yeah. you, I don't want you thinking about it. Because so, what I want you thinking about is, particularly if it's your first time with us, is like, oh, this is, oh, yeah. Oh, I don't, everything's here. Wow, blimey. That's exciting. Well, well gosh, they've, all, they've already thought of that. You know, yeah. sat down to the point of we have literally every charger cable you could ever imagine. <laughs> what a good idea. Because I guarantee you <laughs> someone raced out of the house that morning and forgot yeah. their charging cable. And you guarantee it will be the one sort that you didn't think still existed. So we've got them all and we've got them twice. You know, so we've got one for each studio. We've got spare iPads. You know, we've got, you know, it's over the years you just add more things. You know, down yeah. to the fact that we have um, like a heating pad so that if uh, and if someone's hurt their back or they've got a cramp oh, or right. it, or yeah. also for for ladies at a certain time of a month sometimes with cramping issues it can really help them um it, i have a spare one because i hurt my back years ago playing rugby so every now and again sitting in that chair for eight hours it's like oh god blimey it's like but you can't get up and walk around while someone's halfway through a chapter so just having things like that we also have uh, a piano stool because some people have very bad lower back problems and if you mm. hit you can sit very st- straight upright on a piano stool um and we have softer chairs and so many cushions it's ridiculous you know it's not it's not magic this stuff what i say to everyone is what would it be like if it was you your first time imagine it if it's your first time for example traveling across south london to that place known as croydon everyone's got an issue about coming to croydon i don't know why (laughs) it's a lovely place you know i know the 70s but we could move on that's 40 years ago you know it's like it's safe it's sound it's lovely there's tons of trains you know but i get it you know it's same as me having to go to an unusual studio in far north london or a different city it's like everyone gets anxious yeah. But for technical people, the anxiety can kind of stop once you've got the machinery in front of you because you kind of know what you're doing. Once you've got it into record and everything sounds right, you can kind of go, oh, okay. But for the performer, the anxiety is also within the performance. So there's nothing worse than they're anxious when they're traveling somewhere new. They're anxious when they get there because they've never met you before. And then, of course, they're still anxious about how they're going to perform the thing. So everything you should do as a director, perfor- uh, producer, engineer is put them at their ease. Make sure it's a fun, light environment. Don't make it corporate. Don't make it commercial. You know, there are a few people that do need that. There's a couple of people who need you to be very strict with them. But you mm. learn that as you go along. 90% of the people you ever work with, and this includes the A-lister of the A-listers or the politicians or the super-duper stars, they, they're just people, you know. Um, yeah. And my approach, I learned this approach from Derek Jacobi, I should say. Sir Derek Jacobi, of course. Actually, he's got two knighthoods because of Denmark. So Sir, Sir <laughs> Derek Jacobi, uh, as he once told me and then laughed yeah. hysterically for five minutes. Um, <laughs> he's like, well, what do I call you then? He's like, call me Del. Um, <laughs> was, and I love this phrase. And one of the reasons I used to hire him so much for BBC drama, apart from the fact that he's absolutely the most amazing person who you could ever want to work with, is that he would take the younger actors from a drama off at lunchtime and give them this little speech and i've never forgotten it because i i use it as well which is i, I won't try and impersonate him but he's kind of thing is <laughs> like darlings <laughs> of course um <laughs> you are but plumbers neil or whoever the director is has got a broken pipe and he's looked around and you're apparently the best person to fix it so turn up fix the pipe and just go home okay. and they're all like what do you mean what do you mean lord derek and it's like (laughs) it's like don't be precious yes you've been chosen to do a drama or a reading and yes that should make your ego feel good but once you're there you're there to do a job and if you do that job well that person is going to hire you again and again and again and again and the point of being an uh, uh, an actor is to keep getting work it might be of course to be the greatest star in the universe or to get into star wars or whatever it might be but along the way you're going to have to do hundreds upon hundreds of jobs and if the end of the day you need to pay your mortgage or your rent or your cat fees or whatever it is then doing an audio book or an audio drama which only takes a few days and could net you say a thousand pounds it's got to be way better than being a waiter or working in stacking shelves at tesco or wherever it is 
Mm. And so it's like, and he was always like, the whole point is that you can be proud of yourself and you should be. You know, you can be talented and egotist egotistical about it and you should be. You know, you're, these are amazing people with great talent. Yeah. But you are still there to do a job within a team. And unlike film and television and theatre, it's a very small team. It might only be one person that you ever see, the producer, director. Mm. And they've got a life. They've got worries. They've got concerns. They might be feeling ill. They might have had a terrible journey in. They might be, have a terrible migraine. You might be the 13th book that month. And it's like, oh. So again, from their perspective, and this is, this is a top tip, when you're the talent, I hate that word, but it works, just remember that the other person at that studio you're going to might be equally anxious, equally upset, equally tired. Be a bit human with them. Maybe at lunchtime offer to make them the cup of tea, you know? Because yeah. uh, even though I've said my role is to smooth your way, every now and again, it doesn't happen that often, but every now and again, when someone, when, when the talent pops out and goes, I'm just, or even this, they might even say, oh, I'll just go wash the cup and the cups up before we make the next cup of tea. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't believe it. It's like, they're, but they're human, you know, yeah. but sometimes the talent does get kind of sucked up into this vortex of being the talent, you mm. know, and rarely, rarely will it be that you can't burst that bubble. A couple of politicians I've worked with, couldn't yeah he's literally just just serve them like you're some manservant from bridgerton you know it's just like they, they <laughs> really? wouldn't have it any other way they're just oh, like wow. mm -hmm. yeah you know, and, and, and never with actors even with the hollywood actors i've worked with yeah. it can sometimes take a day or two to for them to trust you because of course you know they're, they're worried that in this very in, intimate environment they might reveal something and you might tell the press yeah yeah you know they don't know you from adam and they've got these intricate lives uh so it can take a time part of that again that's part of being a producer is knowing when to push for almost friendship it's not really friendship but kind of friendship over a few days or yeah. just sit back and just be the professional if they need you to be a professional um you know uh, it's, there's a particularly famous british performer who uh suffers from bipolar disorder and you never quite know who you're going to get on any one day, if you're going to get the really fluffy, gorgeous, cuddly person, or if you're going to get the quite taciturn, officious, no, that's wrong, that's not the right word, but uh, professional, straight, let's just get on with it kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you have to be prepared for that, and you have to deal with that same person in two different ways. Yeah. Uh, and that's really weird when that happens the first time to you. Um, but I think that happens a lot with standard actors. You don't have to have bipolar d disorder to have a great first day, and then everything went wrong on your journey in on day two, and you're just grumpy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so all of these things come into play, being a producer, director. But also, you have to be able to put your ego to one side. You are servicing the author and the narrator. You're there to make them look good. If you're lucky, you'll get your credit at the end of the book, but no one's going to care, unless they've hated, in which case you might get like one of those awful... Uh, audible reviews says who was the idiot producer who allowed the narrator to say xyz you know i've had a few of those over the years i can guarantee i'm going to be having them for the next few years with the terry pratchett stuff uh but uh, but you can't please everyone all the time no of course but you yeah. do have to put it to one side because uh, i've known people who who don't like the idea that they're having to make the tea and coffee or mm. that they have to kind of s hide themselves a little bit in order to let the performer perform and it's, like, right. it's not about it's not about you it's yeah. about the narrator because the narrator is the voice of the author. Doesn't mean you can't have your say creatively as a producer. If you think a voice should be changed or an intonation should be changed, you know, there's many, many an engineer who's been put in the position of producing but with no training. And so either doesn't know how to ask, request, demand a change or just doesn't know that they should do it. And so therefore they let the narrator steamroll and just go through and just go, oh, no, 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 this is how I'm doing it, end of story. And it's like, well, actually, as your first listener, which is that other role I mentioned, mm. it doesn't sound right, you know? It really mm. doesn't. A trap that many narrators fall into is that they, because they've got the words in front of them as they're reading them, they say it in a certain way as though, oh, I can always refer back to it, almost. Because when we read a book with our eyes, our eyes jump back up and down the page all the time to sort of back ref and forward ref and all that stuff. You yeah. can't do that if you just listen to audio. So there's many a time I'm working with the best narrator. I've been working with John Banks recently, who's just one of the all-time greats. Absolute 
legend. But even he, I will pop onto the talk back in like once every four hours or so because he's so good <laughs> and just go, actually, you're saying that word in a way as though I'm meant to know what it means. But without it in front of me, I don't know what it means. You have to hit it harder or softer or change the intonation or make it so we've never heard that word before or we've heard it so many times. It's kind of thing. So yeah. I've got to listen as though I'm the listener, not just as the producer. It's uh, a wacky world. <laughs> so I've, I've got two questions from that, um, if it's OK. Uh, the first one is, is it, how long did it kind of take you to develop that sort of muscle, as it were, to stay sharp for that amount of time, um, to being able to pick up on the most, int- you know, to be as intricate and, and precise mm. as possible throughout, you know, a, a whole day's session. And, you, you know, it might be the end of the week and you'd be doing it all week, etc. Oh, yeah. uh, and then the second thing is as a narrator yourself has that impacted the way that you direct produce engineer projects has that allowed you to sort of step into those toes and say actually it'd be really nice if you know you might have been working on a project you think oh a a producer director could do this for me and then you've gone ahead and changed Mm. your process or you know to cater for that well for the first one uh it's not (laughs) You learn how to stay awake, shall we say, uh, if you've been in it. I was an engineer for many years. So I was there and my whole job was basically press the buttons, make it work technically, but shut up and sit in the corner. Occasionally, yeah. you're, if you have a really nice producer with you, they would say, oh, do if you hear something, do let us know. Obviously, your main job was if I hear something technically at fault, mm-hmm. make sure I flag it. But mm-hmm. only some producers would want you to flag anything editorial, as it were. But even so, you could sit there for days on end learning from them and what they're doing. But Mm. the hardest thing is when you have a really good narrator. So I say, John, who's been in for the last three days, he can go pages without any errors whatsoever. Um, And even then, they're they're just little throat slips or, you know, flips of words. We call them brain farts. It's just where the brain kind of catches up with the eyes and everything goes a bit odd. Um, You know, they're rarely anything serious. And that... I tell you, mid-afternoon, especially you've had lunch, gets to kind of 3.30, it's known as snoozy time for a, for a very good reason. Because <laughs> if you've got someone who's not needing your full attention, it mm. slips. And so I have all these tricks. So I'll use, like, so uh, I, I, we use uh, uh, iPads uh, and I annotate to mark up the script. Mm-hmm. So to do that, I use an Apple Pencil. Uh, other pencils are available, of course. <laughs> um, they won't work with an iPad, but they are there. And um, uh, I actually use it, I kind of like do a bouncy ball thing with it. So like I follow the text. If I know I'm getting a bit, well, you, you know, a bit like when you drive home, you don't realize how you got there kind of thing. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, so I'll kind of purposely bouncy ball or I'll actually read very quietly aloud along with him or her, whoever it is, uh, yeah. just to make sure that I'm just keeping my brain energized. Because one of the biggest problems with audiobooks and any person who comes in and reads them, but also for, for producers, but particularly for actors who are used to being in film and theatre, very physical, is that when you act, you use your whole body to energise you. Your arms are raining, you're you're moving all over the place. And that gives you physical energy. It's like a dynamo. When you're doing audiobooks, you've got to sit still and stop moving. It's so annoying to stop moving. (laughs) They can't do it. But we try to get them to. Uh, And that means there's nothing generating additional uh, energy. It's all in the head and it's all in the lungs. And it's a really hard thing for them. But at least they're moving their jaw up and down and their brain is engaged in reading this thing. For us, we're literally sitting there just looking at an iPad. <laughs> it's like, we can't get up and walk around. We can't do a little dance. We can't, there's nothing for us to keep our body. So you do eventually get to a point of like, oh, uh, Oh, blimey, I, I, ah, where are we? It's like you, see, you hear an error and you can't actually see it on the page because your eyes have kind of dazed off. So yeah. that is a problem. And you only get better at it by just doing more books, but also just being fair to yourself and going, oh, I recognize that's a problem. So what I find is that I, I learn very quickly just to say to the narrator, actually, I think I might need a five minute break. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things when I was working at the BBC, it was like you've never, the technical people never ask for things. It may have changed, but it was yeah. like, you are there to make the magic happen, but we won't recognize that you're important in any way. You're badly mm. paid, you're badly credited, you know, mm. but without you, it's madness. It's like without the technical people in any industry, it doesn't matter how talented the actors are, if they, if they, they can't run a camera or, you know, I had times when the producer couldn't even work out how to open the studio door. 
So it was like, <laughs> without us, you know, you're really not going to get this radio show on air. So <laughs> it's like, have a bit of respect. Uh, yeah. So, it, but yeah, you have to, you have to learn to be willing to say, look, I realize we're up against it, but honestly, I just, even if we're in the middle of a chapter, which I, I generally would say never pause mid chapter, but if it's the yeah. worst of the worst, you absolutely have to go to the loo or your brain is just going mad just say oh you get to a natural pause point just say i'm sorry could we even just have two minutes i'm just going to get out of this chair i'm going to walk outside and walk back in again and that little thing can fix you um now your second point about uh being a narrator and how does that help yeah i think because i came to narrating quite late um for many years i wanted because yeah it's that thing you must know what it's like anyone who's ever directed anyone doing anything there's a point where you go oh just i could just let me just come in and do it you know it's like what's wrong with you why particularly with audiobooks you know we have a kind of a jokey phrase which is just read the damn words it's, it's <laughs> like you know you don't need to overthink this the words are there read the words sentence over but of course it's not that simple of course it's not we know that but it's just frustration coming out but i used to even though i thought i could I, I knew I could read a particularly non-fiction book really well. I never put myself up for it because I had a kind of a feeling like it was a bit like game gamekeeper turned poacher. Right. It seemed unfair. Like, well, maybe I would be picked because, oh, you're Neil, the guy does the producer. Well, of course you could do it. And it felt unfair to all my actor friends. I, I'm there to represent them. I'm not there to represent me. Mm. But a few times I got asked directly. I was like, oh, okay. And then after you've done about four or five, you realize, well, you know what? What I do is for the few that I want to go for, I'll put myself in, but I'll always say on the email, these are the three, four, five people I think would do a really good job, but would you also consider me as well? And then it's fair. Yeah. And then that kind of suddenly turns into like 60 audio books. And, uh, you know, it's like, wow, mad. So in theory, or in essence, I should say, the narrating hasn't really inspired uh the directing producing because i kind of i've done so much before that i kind of already knew all the pitfalls and difficulties that people have yeah what it's known is the other way around though so what i hope and if my one of my editor colleagues steve or morrison or or, or uh christian or ben were here uh, other than them complaining about the sheer amount of belching i do when i when i narrate <laughs> which is like it's just record <laughs> record levels i should ring up guinness i tell you um i don't know why it's like too much deep breaths uh but I hope they would agree that because I know, because I was an editor for, I still am for most of my life, I understand what their job is. And the editor's job is so undervalued by the industry. They're the ones, you know, when you get those five, so, oh my Lord, I can't believe Andy Serkis read The Hobbit so perfectly. Yeah. And he read it brilliantly, did not read it perfectly. What he did was he read it amazingly, and then an editor came in and tidied it up and made it sound awesome. You know, yeah. but the yeah. raw talent was there, but he, you know, Andy likes to do a lot of takes. Uh, so, you know, it, and that's great. That's, he's a performative narrator. He likes to really bring everything full on. So that takes a lot of retaking. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. So I hope when I'm narrating, I'm thinking about what's it like to edit me? What's it like to direct me? Because uh, I'm self-directing anyway, but I'm thinking about, I know where I can go back to to do a pickup. I know um, how to mark up the script as I'm going. A lot mm. of people who self-produce don't mark up their scripts. They do like a clap sound or a click sound. Mm. Drives editors mad. We much It's so easy to mark up a script with, with, a, with, you know, with I annotate. So just mark the script up. Um, so I hope it, in, it helps in that way i've been told it does uh yeah. in between the complaints about the other thing but uh you know i also tried to leave little jokes in for the uh <laughs> steve my main editor actually is a musician by trade and a, and a composer he actually takes he'll, he'll wait several months of books take out all my little bits and turn them into songs uh which is highly embarrassing but i'm happy to share them with the world so as i <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> so yeah it's, it's an interesting one being on both sides of it um, I, I mean, there is a certain amount of me that, of course, anything you do gives you experience, puts it in the back of your mind so that I think particularly when I'm working with people on nonfiction books, because I mostly do nonfiction, it does it does help with that to the extent that I, re I can remember if I'm getting really frustrated with someone, I can remember, well, yeah, but you remember when you did that book a few months ago and it took you 20 takes to get that really difficult medical line, right? It's like, yeah, yeah just, you know, dial it back a bit, you know, just, just, you know, man walk away walk away <laughs> <laughs> you've had um you've had a heck of a lot of amazing people come through the studio doors um, and yeah. i know it's an impossible to talk about favorites and things like that 
But are there any sort of people that kind of stand out, uh, any experiences that kind of stand out to you as, as real big positives uh, that you could tell us about? Yeah, there's a few. Uh, I'll start with just an individual, Gemma Whelan. If you're a fan of Game of Thrones, uh, I wish I could remember the character name. Hey, she survives. Spoilers, <laughs> spoiler alert. She's still alive at the end. Um, uh, Grey John, something Grey John. Anyway, but Gemma Whelan, one of the nicest actors you could ever meet. Um, yeah. And one of the few that when asked to do an audiobook, asks if she can do it with us, which is so nice. rare. Yeah. I know. It's like I'm always recommending people for jobs, even if they're not going to work in our studio. But to get an actor, particularly a... I mean, she is an A-list actor now in yeah. the UK, if nowhere else. But I, sorry, if you're listening, Gemma, you're definitely an A-list <laughs> actor everywhere in my mind. But, you know, she is absolutely just exploding. Um, and, you know, she will always say, can I do it at Neil's? Now, they can't always... But it's nice that someone of that stature, because yeah. that's how we get work. It's not just my relationships with publishers. If, if top line narrators request a studio, whoa, that's, that's, that's the gold star standard. But Gemma is a, a sweetheart. She's a lovely, lovely person to work with. She's really funny. Um, I mean, just such a laugh to work with. But once, once you say we're rolling, it, it's like the John Banks thing I was telling you about. It, it, it's pages go past without any mistakes, but all the characters are prepped, all the work's been done. It's a great story. Um, you know, she is worth every penny that she costs and more. Uh, and she's built up a massive audience, of course, of fans, loyal fans. So always Gemma, just such a joy. Um, but I know what you want me to say, and I'm going to say it anyway, because it is Doctor Who. <laughs> so I am, you know, I was born in 1974. Tom Baker literally became, literally, his first show aired the day I was born. Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. June the 8th, 1974. There you go, ID thievers. Um, <laughs> that evening, 5.15, BBC One, first episode with Tom Baker aired. Uh, I told him that many years ago, and he found it highly amusing, um, and then said, oh, you make me feel very old, Neil, uh, <laughs> which is true. Yeah, fair enough. But of course, so he wasn't officially my first doctor, but he is my doctor. Hmm. Myself and my best friend, Pete, who sadly is not with us, he passed away 18 years ago, but we've always been, yeah, I, I talk about him in the in, in the present tense, because he's always here. So, you know, yeah. we, all, we grew up as, as Doctor Who fans. We loved Doctor Who. We were there during its hiatus and, and got the videotapes and the books, and I love old Doctor Who. That's not to say I don't love new Who, but, you know, I grew up in old Who. Yeah. So to get the chance to have... And the Doctors themselves are awesome. I mean, Colin Baker is one of the most fun people you could ever want to spend time in the studio with. I mean, the guy's crazy. I love him. He's so <laughs> nice. And I, I loved his Doctor. I know he's a bit, you know, Marmite for some people. I loved his Doctor, and I love him as a person. So the Doctors are lovely to me. And, you know, bringing Tom back... For the mm. first time in 29 years, when we did the Serpent's Crest Hornet's Nest series, uh, before Big Finish, we got there first at the BBC. <laughs> Sorry, Big Finish, we love you, but we got there first, just. Uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly it's like he's back and he was on full form. It was like, yeah. oh my, someone brought in some a bag of jelly babies. And I was a bit nervous <laughs> thinking, oh, he might be a bit. And he was like, no, no, no. He went, he did the whole thing like a jelly baby. <laughs> and it was just, oh, and Mel, if, if Pete could be alive now, I mean, it's like he's, he was haunting the, all the sessions. I know he was. Um, but actually, it's when you get the companions. I mean, yeah. let's all admit, we've all fallen in love with at least one companion. You know, mostly all the companions. Um, but, you know, working with Elizabeth Sladen was one of the joys of my life. And the fact that she was there, she was ready to support me when I did my first book. Um, uh, when I wrote, an, I wrote a book which was illustrated by Robert Rankin and it was about to come out. And then, then she was all ready to come that Saturday uh, to be at the oh. book launch and, and support me. Yeah. I'm a producer. Why the hell would Liz Sladen want to? But this is who she was. You know, to yeah. ask anyone stories about Liz Sladen, and she was there for you as just as a human being. But obviously, what happened happened, and and she was extremely ill and then passed away. Um, yeah. But those sessions with Liz, I mean, we're all in love with Liz. Whatever age you were, she was always amazing. But being her presence was a joy. And to this day, I get to share not just studio time because I've become. I still find this really weird to say. I am, I, I can say this, without, I, I feel egotistical, but I'm friends, <laughs> proper friends, with Louise Jameson and Nicola Bryant and Bonnie Langford. What? And Sophie Aldred. What's going on? <laughs> the 
11, 11, 12 year old. Yeah, I I think Sophie might have been one of my first proper crushes. And like I've told her this, you know, and Nicola, obviously, I mean, who wasn't in love with Nicola Bryant? And it's like, and yeah, I've told them this, and you know, you laugh about it as friends and you move on and sort of have another pint. But it's just like, (laughs) it's weird. You know, I, I. the, the person who was there for me when, when I, I was in a relationship for many years uh, and, and when it fell apart, the, on the day it fell apart, the person who was there for me was Nicola Bryant. Crazy. How crazy. Yeah. I mean, because she is gorgeous. Um, but all of them, this is the thing, the joy of it, no matter who you work with, and we're talking famous names here, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But, you know, if you treat people as human beings and you respect their talent and you help them, yeah, some people have called producers like kingmakers. You know, we're, we're there to make someone else famous. We're there to make yeah. someone else sound the best. And we are. We should be. You know, if we can be carried along with them, you know, like a few celebs will pull a producer with them or a director or a co-writer. You know, think of um, uh, uh, Alan Partridge and Baby Cow Productions. You know, um, Steve, you know, and Henry Normal. They go back a long way, but they kind of came yeah. together as a package. So if you want Steve, you get Henry. If you want Henry, you get Steve. That kind of thing. It's like that's how to do it. Yeah. So to have these people who are always happy to come hang out with you and work with you is great. But when, like that first year after I split after a long time with my my, my long time partner, um, a couple of months later it was my my birthday, and I was, I was you know you, you're depressed. You know you're not thinking about life. You know you're just going to think I'm just going to literally I'm going to go. I'm just gonna, not even going to go to the pub on my own. I'm just going to stay at home and wallow. I'm going to be a really sad you know whatever yeah yeah and then like two days before i get a phone call from from uh from my friend john he goes uh you're coming down to guildford and i'm taking to the pub for your lunch i'm like okay that's nice all right yeah fine so I go down to guildford and i've invited and there's like three or four companions there <laughs> oh, my oh my god i'm having <laughs> birthday and they've all bought me a little present i mean nothing expensive or amazing it's just nice yeah, little yeah. like oh we thought you might like that. Like, and literally i'm just there's a bit halfway through and i'm just sitting there going whoa if if a my 11 year old self but also pete i know he's here but if pete was really here his brain would be exploding um it was incredible and that that that, that's what doctor who has brought me the joy of making who is amazing particularly because we focus a lot at bbc audio on the old stuff the old companions there's not much we do in the new realm apart from the occasional exclusive uh, mm. BBC Books have kind of pulled away from doing full-length novelizations of the n- modern Doctors, uh, which is a shame, I think. How co- do you know why? I'm not sure. I have heard rumours it might be just because people don't buy them. Um, right. You know, they just yeah. don't sell enough. I might be wrong. So if BBC yeah. Books are listening, I apologise. Uh, I know <laughs> Albert and Co. put a hell of a lot of hard work into the stuff. But there is yeah. just a thing that, let's be fair... <sighs> modern who audiences love the visuals of who they love mm-hmm. what's on television i'm not sure they necessarily are in the market for ancillary materials in the same way that people mm-hmm. in my age you know in their late 40s you know we we grew up with it in an era where it wasn't available on vhs oh. it was, vhs wasn't out yet and even when it was the doctor who didn't come out for many years all you had was the show if it was repeated on tv the occasional um kind of official audio soundtrack that might get played on the radio if you're lucky but probably not and it might come out on record but it will probably not yeah. or the target novelizations and that was what we were into we all read and devoured those target novelizations because you know occasionally particularly if it was ian Marta writing them he'd sort of go back into the full shooting script and add back in the bits that hadn't been filmed you know yeah. uh terence dicks on the other hand you know he used to kind of like you know you can always tell a terence dicks target book let me put it this way because the running down corridor scenes are really fast. Whereas if it's Ian or one of the other writers, they're quite descriptive and long. <laughs> it's really funny. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Never look at the cover. Just look for the first running scene. It's like, if it's fast, <laughs> if there's no description of what door they're running through, it's a Terence Dix adaptation. It's like, knock them out, cheap production. You know, but they're great because what his books did were they had that pace of the TV show. Whereas I think Ian and some of the others felt like, oh, what we can do is we can add some lore, some history, some background into this. So with all that said, my generation making it now, and Michael, the uh, commissioning editor, is within the same age group as me. It's like, oh, we really just want to revisit those classic books. Uh, And that's what we've been doing a lot of, is taking the original Target novelizations uh, and turning them into audiobooks, uh, which is really fun. Um, yeah. And then recently, what BBC Books have been doing is taking some of the modern era Who 
and turning them into target novelizations. And then we're then turning the target novelizations <laughs> into audio. It's a bit crazy. It's a bit weird. It's like, uh... So, like, next week I'm doing a, a Peter Capaldi one. And you think, okay, that's fantastic. Okay. Not with Peter, unfortunately. Yeah. I wish, I wish, I wish. Um, mm. um, there was a period when we were doing uh, the Matt Smith era, and nearly everything was either done by one of the special guest stars or the absolutely awesome Arthur Darville. Uh, who played Rory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it must have been about five or ten with Arthur. Oh, my Lord. I just, it's like, come back to the studio, Arthur. It's like, <laughs> I miss him so much. We had so like, a couple of years where it's like literally every other month we were hanging out and doing stuff together. And he's oh, so God. talented as an audiobook reader. I actually got him to do some non-Who stuff for Audible, um, some science fiction and a few other weird things. And, oh, man, if ever there was a person designed for audiobook narration <laughs> it's arthur really? darville yeah. oh yeah 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 he was like and i think also because you know karen was very busy and matt really didn't want to do audio particularly and so arthur was like yeah i'll do it you know i mean <laughs> in for a dollar in for whatever you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know great we'll just, just go to a studio and make silly voices together it was, it was so <laughs> much fun but it is great it's such an honor i mean it, it's a tightrope walk because as you can imagine the fans are super critical yeah and you know, these books have got typos, so you fix the typos. But then someone might write in and say, oh, you fixed the typo. And it's like, well, yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. Uh, one of the things I find fascinating, and Louise Jameson pointed this out to me years ago, and we have to do it every time now, is in the show, Louise made a character decision for Leela where she never uses contractions. So it's always it is, not it's, or was not instead of wasn't. She yeah. ne- well, she, every now and again, she slipped. But you know, basically, the character never use contractions yet in all the books they've got her using contractions so when louise comes in we always send a quick note to the bbc to say i know you want this word perfect but in the leela bits we're going to remove all the contractions and they're like oh yeah yeah of course thanks for reminding us that's cool but it's like but there are some fans who have said um you've changed the script they're literally reading the book as they're listening and it's like yeah yeah but surely we're doing the right thing because we're making leela correct we're not yeah yeah you know, my favorite one uh are the typos now, now i don't think anyone complained about us fixing this one but it was my favorite typo ever um i think it's i think it's delta and the bannerman i'm, I'm terrible at remembering the books but it was <laughs> bonnie came in to read it and it's infamous it has this typo that says the doctor peed over the wall or peed over the crates or something like that it's yeah. meant to be peered <laughs> it, it, the r's are missing so it's peed and it's really well known everybody loves it and I'd just forgotten to mention it to Bonnie because I thought, well, she's prepped the book. She must know it's there. So, you yeah. know, because we get to it and whatever reason she did know, but she'd forgotten as well. So she just rolls through this line and then just sort of stops and just starts giggling. <laughs> and I'm giggling because it's so funny hearing Bonnie say peed. You know, we yeah. are just 10 year olds at the end of the <laughs> yeah. day, you know. Uh, and then, of course, we fix it. And- everything's fine but i would love to know if someone did actually write in and say well officially <laughs> since it was printed <laughs> but you know you do have to bear all that in mind yeah. you also have these things like on the show particularly the older episodes like the, the stuff from the 60s through to probably the early 80s a lot of the secondary characters are straight out of central casting so a lot of them just spoke in a, a, a variant of rp yeah um received pronunciation for those who don't know um a uh, very very kind of middle class middle english accent but when they wrote the books you know the authors would it would describe the aliens that have a deep and sepulchral voice or he, my, my favorite ones he uh it changed its voice from like deep and sepulchral when it reveals itself to fluty and high-pitched as though wind through chimes <laughs> nice yeah great on page yeah. what does that mean um <laughs> But also there's things like accent work and stuff like that. And so we have this moment sometimes, and me and Michael will discuss this, because there are, you know, the fans will, will often want what was on the TV show, yeah, not what's in the book. Yeah. But the book literally says, he spoke in his broad Birmingham accent. Well, you can't then not do it in a broad Birmingham accent. So it's like, wow, wow, wow ooh, ah. Yeah. These are director questions. It's like, ah, oh, I've got to make. A... These are the things that people hate me for because I have to make a decision <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, or if the word has got two or three different popular pronunciations, we've just got to pick one. Yeah, you know, of course. You know, yeah. so yeah, what are you got to do? You know, they're only I... audio books. We're not saving lives. You know, <laughs> although I tell you that a little little story. Years back, uh, I was on a phone call with a big client. And uh, something had been con- continuously going wrong. And unusually for me, I got a little bit shirty. And I finally kind of broke on this phone call and went, Oh, we're, look, they're just audiobooks. We're not saving lives. 
And there's this long silence, long silence. I'm thinking, oh no, I've lost it. I've lost it. I'm, he'll never use us again. I can't afford to lose a client. Yeah. And then he just starts laughing. I thought, what? What's getting? He goes, you're never going to guess what the next book is I was about to send you. I went, no, because it's the SAS field guidebook to saving lives. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, no, yeah. you're making it up. He goes, no, I'll send you it quickly. He sent me the PDF and it literally was. It's like, okay, so some audio books do save lives. Okay. <laughs> Madness. That's, that is incredible. What experiences. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It really is. And, you know, now, you know, we're, as you know, we're doing the Terry Pratchett series, which. Yeah just the biggest I think probably the biggest audiobook project in the world at the moment in terms of its yeah, expectations so. and you know probably not I mean we've certainly done series longer I mean a year and a half ago for Peng also for Peng when we did the Georgette Heyer series which was like 51 oh, really? books so this is yeah. 40 books so it's a little less books um certainly less in fact I think in running hours a little bit less than the Dorothy Dunnett series we did three or four years ago which I think ran up into about the five six hundreds in terms of hours my gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we kind of, I'm really proud that my company, this little sort of one man beast with amazing freelancers, gets mm. offered these big things to do. And Pratchett's a thing I've been involved with them for two or three years, helping with the original pitch and, yeah. you know, helping come up with the ideas as to what we can do and how we'll do it. So now we're doing it. It was really scary. <laughs> and yeah. It's like, oh, the, the weight of expectation is um i've still not looked at any reviews for hogfather which we released at christmas because i just know there'll be some people who just they won't like the choice of uh, of narrator they won't like the choice of some of the pronunciations they won't like the choice of some of the character voices because they've always yeah. heard them a certain way of course you know yeah. you know it's yeah. the same problem that hitchhiker's guide had all those years you know there's still people to this day who think that um uh, that simon you know playing uh playing arthur dent is wrong he's wrong because they've only ever seen the movie for example mm. so they they they, they hear um Oh, names just dropped out of my head. Uh, uh, Martin, uh, come back Martin to me. Martin Freeman. Martin Freeman. So they've heard Martin Freeman, who of course was channeling Simon anyway. Um, but uh, they've heard him and then they thought, oh, I'll, I'll listen to that radio series. And they don't like so Yet Arthur Dent is Simon. He was written, he's basically a parody of Simon. The, uh, the, you know, Douglas Adams had worked with Simon, uh, Simon Jones, um, and, uh, and loved him, fell in love with him, thought he was amazing, and decided to write a character based on what he looks like and sounds like. So Arthur Dent yeah. is Simon Jones. So you can't say it doesn't, but to your head it might sound wrong. Mm. You know, and that's absolutely fair. And, you know, and I've said to Penguin, and we talked with Rob at the estate about all this, like, yeah, the expectation is some people are always going to prefer what's in their head, some yeah. people are going to, and as they should do, loved what Tony Robinson did, what Stephen Briggs did, what Nigel Planer did. You know, those guys did incredible jobs with their versions. But mm. it's a chance now with this anniversary coming up uh, of, of Terry's, well, obviously of his passing, of his birth and, uh, and of his publication history. It's a great opportunity just to say for a new generation, here they are afresh. You know, new cover art, new book copies to go out and spend yet more money on, uh, you know. Not giving me free copies. I'm gonna to have to buy them myself. It's like, Ugh, but I'm happy to. Um, yeah. But I just know it's like we're thinking about that. You know, the, the turtle, great at chewing. Some people call it great at chewing, like a chew. And some people call him great at chewing. What one do we use? <laughs> and yeah. they've left it up to us. So I'm not sure. Maybe we'll flip between the two, or not. You know, it's really hard. I'm hoping to ask Rob to give me a final decision, although we've already done like 10 books. So it's like, it's pretty much going to have to stay the way we've done it. Uh, yeah. But it's really interesting. It's like, there's some characters in there and we're not recording them in order. We were doing them in different orders. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. it's not in, it's not in publication order. We're doing them in groups. So uh, in April this year, uh, about the time this podcast comes out, uh, the 28th of April, yeah. uh, the first set come out, that's a witches series uh, that India of Armour, best known yeah. from Torchwood and uh, Game of Thrones and other things uh, and the new Star Wars Obi-Wan series she's one of the leads in that oh wow I nice. know yeah. she kept saying throughout the recording oh I'm doing this thing I can't tell you what it is and then on the last day she goes I can tell you <laughs> like, I'm like I'm like one of the lead bad guys in, in Obi-Wan Kenobi oh, just, arr, arr. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> thanks Star Wars another one <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah so we're doing that plus one of the one-offs we're doing we've done Small Gods with uh, He Who Is Lord Andy Serkis um that was a busy three days, I can tell you. That man's schedule is mad. I can imagine. What's oh. it like? What's it? Sorry to cut you. Out. I must. I must. No, I know. I um, say this will be an eight-hour podcast, but you know, you feel free to cut me off at any time. It's it's a, it's a real fanboy question. I do apologise. I really no, please. said to myself I wasn't going to. Um, no, ask please. And, and, Andy Andy Circus. What was what was that like? I mean, the guys are. 
you know, yeah. a deity, isn't he? He's, he's yeah. just... I, I had the luck that back in 2007 and eight, when I did my The Brightonomicon comedy audio series for BBC Audio Books, which I co-wrote and directed, he was our lead bad guy in that. And that was just off the back of him having finished doing King Kong. So he was in his massive ascendancy at the point. Mm. Uh, but I'd met him back then. So... I'm not normally nervous anyway, but sometimes when it's a big name and you've not worked with them before, it's a little nervous because you don't know what their attitude is going to be like, especially on a first morning. Yeah. And in this case, he was coming down to Croydon. Like, my Lord, Hollywood A-list, they're coming to Croydon. <laughs> ah. Um, so there was like, and I'd been hoovering up and, and you know, I'd said to Morris in the studio next door, let's make sure that everything's perfect and let's make sure yeah. nothing goes, because, you know, we want, to, want him to report back that coming to Croydon is fine. Yeah. Um, and, of course, he literally, Venom 2 had just come out, which he directed. So I knew he was going to be busy doing promotional stuff for that. And it, but, of course, he comes in, and I cleverly, I think cleverly anyway, put some photos up uh, of us back from 2007 recording yeah. uh, Brightonomicon. And he immediately saw them. He goes, oh, that's where I know you from. And it just helped break the ice. It just gave us a moment of, oh. I, and, and you can see it's like, oh, I feel safe with you now. Mm. I remember that was fun. That was silly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, we then had to spend time sort of him making sure he understood me as a director. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a matter of I've not actually directed him doing audio books before, only doing drama. So mm. I didn't know what his approach was going to be, how well prepped he was. And yet prep is such an important thing with audio books. And people still to this day turn up who've not even read the book before they come into the studio. And right, they're the yeah. sort of people where you really do want to tell them off. Because it's like, mm. what's going on? And most is because their agents haven't told them to do it. But it's like, really? A um, bit weird. But so he came in and, you know, he's larger than life. I mean, he is. I mean, he's a big you know, rugby playing type physique guy anyway. He's a big, powerful man. Yeah. Uh, and he's Andy Serkis and he's only gotten more famous. <laughs> it's like there's some Wikipedia thing that says he's like the sixth highest paid UK actor of all time or something, which he argues he is not. I, <laughs> I think they might mean all the films he's been in make him the sixth highest grossing. Yeah actor british actor possibly but you know since he's not been in harry potter it's like come on you know there's a few question marks there but yeah point is he has been in star wars so yeah, yeah. um it's to say was i nervous was i anxious yes just for the first hour like, i don't know how he's going to approach this um we hadn't had an opportunity to speak before recording which is unusual because he was so busy he was flying all over the place so i hadn't had any insight into which voices voice choices he'd made and again it's pratchett you know so I know how important these choices are. Yeah. Luckily, Small Gods almost sits in its own little bubble. It really doesn't interact with the rest of the Discworld series, particularly in terms of characters. So I wasn't too worried about having to tell him, no, you can't do that because that character in, turns up in book 18 and he has to be like this, which I've had to do a lot of with the other books. Um, yeah. They're fun conversations to have. Um, but he came and he said, oh, right, yeah, I've got these ideas. This is what I'm going to do for the voices. And it's like, I had to recalibrate for a second because they definitely weren't the voices that were in my head. But then hearing him do them, so I said, well, I'll tell you what, give me like a page. Like, let's find a page, particularly between brother and Om, the god. Give me a bit of, you know, to and fro so I can hear it. So he did it, and it's like, yeah, who am I to say no to Andy Serkis when he's doing that level of talented performance? Yeah. So once I got through that, all it was was my biggest fear with Andy is that I didn't have much time. We literally had three days, and a few hours out of one of those days, we're going to be eaten up by marketing and promotional stuff, which you've probably seen some of the photos and videos yeah. of that started sprinkling up. Yeah. Um, boy, he looks good. That hair, that quiff. Didn't have that on the day. He had a big beard. Uh, and, and just nervousness about, can we get him home in time? You know, I know he's got Zoom meetings and this meeting. and that. So that yeah. was my main thing, was actually, can I service his external requirements? Because he was just bringing it. Um, yeah. But I will say this, and he won't mind me saying, he is, he is a, I keep saying the word performative at the moment, but it's a great word. He's a performative narrator. So he, it's, many people narrate with characters, he narrates as a character. Right. So he found yeah. the voice of the narrator. It is Andy, but it's a, a character of Andy. Yeah. John Coleshaw is very similar. He finds a narrator voice for his Doctor Who books. Uh, and then, obviously, he then has all of his characters on top. Uh, very that, that, The joy of Andy, of course, he's got a very powerful physique, which means he's got a very powerful set of lungs, which means that he could get through a very tight 
three days with a lot of big he chose some big voices let's just yeah. put it that way um particularly om when you hear it it's going to be oh yeah that's that's going to be a vocal workout for for 13 hours or whatever it is uh, <laughs> and of course it was longer than that because you know so he you know there would be times where we do three four five takes of a line not because he was doing it wrong but because he wanted to just give it a little bit of nuance and yeah. he was so and this is what i'll tell you I can't speak on behalf of any other audio person who's ever worked with him, but I do know the people who, who, who have worked with him, and I knew they would say this. He is so generous to you as the producer-director. He doesn't need to be. He's anti circus He could do it on his own. But he sees that you're there and you have a job to do, and so he defers. And so he'll give you options, and he'll do retakes and other... But once you say, we've got it, mate, move on, it's all right, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. hey, jog on yeah, no problems you know and you wouldn't you think he'd be so busy and hectic that he wouldn't want to share lunch with you and then uh, sit down talk see what's going on ask questions see how life is you know yeah. it, it goes back to the point that even the biggest stars are just human beings with a, as long as you can work around their life and their needs if they need you to shut up and keep out of the way because they've got a lunch time for the zoom meetings you do that but Otherwise, they want to chat. They want to ask about your cats and, you know, oh, you moved home. So that's exciting. Show me the photos. Because why wouldn't they? You know? Yeah. But he, he it's still, it's still, I still buzz. And I've been just been looking at the, the documentary they're making about the behind the scenes. And there he is. And I'm thinking, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, and I did do the thing that you do do. But this is the rule. And this is my rule. If you want stuff signed, if you want to be a fanboy, you wait to the end. <laughs> professional, 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 sad, geeky fanboy mode right at the very end. So he was quite funny because he goes, ah, right. He had to race off. He goes, oh, I see you've got a bag of stuff. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was going to, I hope you didn't mind. I brought a few things, but you know, I know you're busy. You got rid No, 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 no. We'll stop in there. What do you want? Signs. There's my Lord of the Rings uh, and my Hobbit steel books. I want them signed. And I, here's my Planet of the Apes. And I, blah, blah. And this special thing is like, yeah. And it's like, again, I, I know it's part of their act. They learn to do that and to be gracious to the people, but you don't need to be. You could just say, I'm busy, I've got to move on and do this thing. But he took that extra five minutes. Yeah. And he didn't just put Andy Circus. He wrote little messages and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, no, one, no one's going to see them. They're in my sh on my shelf. They're for me when I get old and farty, or older and fartier. And I can look and go, who? Who was that? Andy, who? <laughs> uh, you know, but it, it's, it's a really nice thing that someone of his stature. You know, yeah. And what was really great over the lunch times is being able to ask, well, what's it like directing a Marvel movie? You know, that's I what bet, I wanted to I know bet. about. What's it like being part of that machine? You know, what's it like having the weight of a of a sequel? Yeah. And also to ask about, you know, the second unit, second unit directing he did on the Hobbit series. You know, and was he or wasn't he involved in the Amazon series? And, you know, what projects has he got going on at Imaginarium and how well... Because when we, when we last met, he literally was just going to Company's house to create Imaginarium. Oh, wow, yeah. And now he's like, yeah. whatever it is, 12, 14 yeah, yeah, years yeah. on, and it's like this incredible company. Yeah. But there, and it was really fine to say, oh, there's like this there's this games company in Croydon near us. And he goes, what, what, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, yeah, we partner with them all the time, yeah. <laughs> so it was just mad that you, so, you suddenly just become two people mm. nattering about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, yeah. And then you know he walks off to go to the loo, and you suddenly go, "Whoa, hey, it's Andy Circus." <laughs> I was I was gonna say, do you ever? Because you, you must get lot, you know, when you you're doing a job and you're there for hours, and you you know you, the professional side switches on, and, and and you become that, you know, you wear the director producer hat, and, and you get that yeah. job done. I was gonna say, you must you must get home from these projects and just go, I cannot believe the day I've had. I cannot believe the people yeah. I've just spent time with. Absolutely, I mean, much less so now, but. Yeah. It, sometimes it's who it is obviously sometimes yeah. it's the project so like the Pratchett thing at the moment I still mm -hmm. pinch myself that I'm the person doing the Pratchett and like, as I say I've just watched the first cut of the documentary and there's a couple of really famous people mentioning me and there's like Rob at the estate talking about me and it's like oh my god and I think oh no I hope they don't get my address out otherwise I'll be hunted <laughs> down by angry Pratchett fans because we said great Atchewin instead of great Atchewin or whatever it is yeah. you know uh but yeah, uh, what what I harp on about this, but he was so important to me as my best friend. I, what I do is when I'm driving away, particularly with Doctor Who and science fiction stuff, is I think yeah. Pete would have just gone mad about this. Yeah. You know, it really would have. And so, and it's why I say to people when we talk about, you know, how fandom can be quite aggressive towards mm. things like Who and Star Wars and everything. 
I always say to people when we talk about this is like I think about Pete so Pete wasn't here he missed the end of the first Lord of the Rings trilogy never saw The Hobbit missed the end of the Star Wars prequels never saw the Renaissance and Star Wars mm. it wasn't alive when Doctor Who came back incredible to think but he wasn't it was yeah. just before it came back never saw any of that so I approach things like I might not like a thing I might not appreciate what they're doing with it but I don't need to hate it and I can yeah. guarantee anyone listening no one who's gone in to make that thing that you think is terrible did it to make a thing that's terrible you know mm-hmm. they went in with passion and love and dedication but there may have been budget issues creativity issues corporate issues it may simply be that they do a thing that they think is good and you don't you don't have to hate on it and that's how i feel about coming home from a job it might not be the best book i've ever done or my favorite story or my i love the author it yeah. might be a difficult day with a particular actor but i go home thinking well, that was cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah, particularly for the, like the one thing i haven't done yet is star wars and i keep pestering penguin but nearly all star wars is done in america um yeah. But like my friend Kevin Scott is one of the main uh, Star Wars writers, you know, and it's like, I mean, he's, he's all joking about that. Come on, you know, you, you know, George Lucas, get him to ask for me personally, even if it's just like, can I just do an advert or like a, a little yeah. trailer or something? There must be something yeah. I could do in Star Wars. But like, I've got lots of actor chums who have been in Star Wars. So I'm feeling like I'm almost there. I'm nearly, nearly quite almost made it. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It's like, but even if it's not, so like, I'll give you an example. A few months ago, we did this incredible, uh, audiobook uh one little secret um by dandy smith it was her first debut novel uh and i was able to cast two actresses well actors i should say uh, who i absolutely adore uh daphne kuma and georgia Maguire, and it has done so well and uh the author is so happy with it uh, she came onto our clubhouse room a few weekends ago and just gushed it was lovely and I've come away so enthused about audiobooks off of that because it's a book I never would have picked up myself. You know, it's it's a kind of a thriller, mystery, chiclet, beach read thing. It's yeah. so good. Uh, but I got to hire two friends who really did a good job. I got to make an author really happy. And a whole load of listeners have now got an audiobook. That they're over. I can come away and grin like an idiot about that book. Uh, because it is everything that Labrook is set out to do. We use both studios at the same time, both me and Morrison producing at the same time, actress actors, sorry, uh, in the same uh, in the in the adjoining studios at the same time, sharing lunch, talking about the book. It mm. came together so perfectly, and we've got this end product which distills the essence of audiobooks, which is a great book read by great people in a great way. And I can be happier about that than knocking out another Doctor Who. You know? Yeah, I've yeah. done hundreds of Doctor Who, and I love doing Doctor. Who. Yeah, Steve, Michael, if you're listening, I love doing Doctor Who. More Doctor Who. <laughs> Keep sending Doctor Who. We love the Doctor Who, but you know, it's another Doctor Who. You know, yeah. whereas what, a, a, a random book that turns up and really gets people excited, that's as that's as important to me as doing a Terry Pratchett series. You know, because yeah. Terry Pratchett's going to come to an end. You know, we're still doing. You know, we we've done four other books this week. You know, uh, it was so, you know, by the time we finished 40 Terry Pratchett books, we probably would have done another 150 other books at the same time. You know, the yeah. world doesn't stop because Terry Pratchett's happening. Well, I think Penguin would like it to stop so that we could focus on Terry Pratchett. But, you know, the bills have to be paid. Uh, yeah. I love them as I do. But, you know, they have to be paid. So, yeah, it's but you're right. You know, you, you clearly have the same fanboy instincts as I. So, yes, don't let me don't let you, don't don't walk away thinking that every time even someone I've worked with lots of times, like if Louise Jameson turns up, Nicola Bryant turns up, uh, Colin Baker turns up, any of those guys, you know, David Warner, who I can't believe I'm friends with David Warner. I mean, nah! you know, it's still, once they've gone, they're in their cab and they've headed off home, we've said goodbye, we've had a little hug or COVID safe fist bump or whatever it is you have yeah. to do today. Is I will still stand there on my own, looking around. I actually thank my studio every time I close up because <laughs> I dreamt of having like a studio it. I dreamt of owning my own studios for all my life and I own my own studios everything in there I own you know I've got stupid amounts of equipment it's mine so I thank yeah. it every day I thank Darwin our, our Muppet mascot every day for uh, inspiring everyone to smile and be happy but I will still I will sit there and I will just go oh I just spent the day with David Warner nice <laughs> just, you know, yeah. producers 
we all wish we were famous and rich and everything else but at the end of the day actually what we enjoy i, I think if you're a really good producer director you enjoy being a kingmaker you, mm. you have to it's like anyone on the other side of a microphone or any other side of a camera you know we are as passionate about what we do as the talent is about what they do yeah um and that's why you know uh it's good to represent that um it's good to talk about that it's good to make sure that people know that the technical people are as important as the let's call them the talent i know it sounds yeah. deprecating but you know they are talented but so are we you know um 100%, yeah. yeah and it's a weird world at the moment you know, post covid you know during covid everyone set up home studios because they couldn't come to professional studios and even though the publishers supported us and kept sending us work and then as soon as we could open people started coming back and we're now pretty much all fully open again hmm. uh people invested they bought home studios they built forts and then they built under stair cupboard things and you know david Tennant still does stuff from under his stairs it's really weird but it's still cool uh and then you know many of them invested like i have where i am at the moment in a home booth um yeah. and so we were in a place where we weren't a few years ago which is a lot of the industry particularly publishers and smaller publishers or certain particular publishers push for narrators to be their own producer their own editor mm-hmm. their own everything and we're being cut out on the studio mm. side luckily the big big publishers aren't doing this although it's useful because if we do want someone who can't travel or is old and can't travel or is ill yeah. or has childcare things that means we can say to them well you can still work with us but you record at home and we'll either remote produce or you know whatever mm. it's it yeah. makes it really handy for that but it, it it is scary that a lot more books have been particularly the technical end not just the recording but the p- post-production are being handed off to people who've never done it before and they're they're learning the basics and they sound fine but they don't sound amazing and that yeah. really worries me that you know that there's a willingness on behalf of certain publishers to almost downplay the technical artistry of a really good editor and a really good proof listener and a really good mastering engineer just because it saves them a few hundred quid yeah which is worrying to me it, it is worrying it's also i mean I guess I do understand, obviously I understand that, you know, nobody likes spending money and if they can save money, then I, I understand Absolutely. that aspect of it, but it's, you know, the audiobook industry is, you know, exploding and there's better, you right. know, there's amazing things happening. And it, yeah, as you say, it just, it'd just be nice if that was kind of... Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, look, we over the last few years, we've seen an opening up at least of credits. So at least half the publishers now not uh, will, will, will credit both the producer and the editor which is a shock horror. Uh, there's a few who won't, but we slip it in anyway. It's like, like you know, tough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're putting it in. You can edit it out later if you don't like it. Uh, yeah. But it's like, I think they don't mind at the end of the day, really. Um, mm. So that's been a nice change. Um, yeah. Audible, to their credit, you know, people say some, you know, have different opinions about Audible. Um, but, you know, any market leader has positives and negatives to them. But, you know, they were the first to push up their rates a year or mm. so ago for narrators and technical staff mm. uh, not massively but you know, it was a nice gesture um, and some of the other publishers have slowly started increasing production costs but very few um, narrator costs it's there's a lot of let's put it this way there's a lot of narrators and they're unionized so you know equity in the US in the UK sag after in the US yeah. you can make a lot of noise and publishers kind of can be embarrassed into feeling like yeah okay we'll 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 pay you a bit more especially if you've done enough audiobooks you know you of course you warrant more as mm. you should do uh technical people unfortunately there's no union either side of the atlantic that, that that directly represents there are some trade bodies that do their best um and as you know i i run a thing called the audiobook creators alliance which is trying to do something like that but it's not really a trade body mostly because what i don't want and i i i one of the tactics that's used against, I suppose we are, a cottage industry, mm. is that you, if you want, if you're on the other side of the fence, the thing you want to do is you want to make us fight each other. So you want to make it so that narrator fights narrator for a job, studio fights studio, studio fights home, blah, 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 blah. You split and you split and you split and you make it so that if we all come together, it's actually quite bad for us. Mm. So we have to stand. So there is a natural urge to say, well, the narrators uh, should earn more money because they've been doing more books and their talent is what sells the book. But the production houses, you know, actually, if we give them more work, I get this conversation quite often, 
can we can we give you a discount what so you give me 10 books instead of five and you want me to give you a 10 percent discount but the biggest cost of all your books is a narrator and unless it's the same narrator on 10 books where's the saving being made yeah it's not a production line you know each book is mm. bespoke so you have these conversations with them it's like and they, it's like they try to split you so the reason i started the aca for example and you know, sag after and equity and other groups are, are very up for for working with us would say no 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 we all agree on the technical side that narrators are worth a hell of a lot more particularly in the U- uk where rates have been low for a long long time uh, for various odd reasons which we can go into but are very dull but but you know are important yeah. um but they're very vocal they're very good at representing themselves and they get response if all technical people do is complain and go oh that's not fair we want more money too you're not going to get very far because there's only a very very small number of us you know yeah. compared to narrators but what if the narrators said hang on a second our mates on the technical side aren't getting a pay increase this year but we've all got something but surely their costs have gone up as well hmm. so how do we get that if you have a group that says everybody who makes audiobooks everybody narrators technical people composers artists everyone everyone who isn't the person paying the bill comes together and says we all deserve something more that is a bit more powerful because the publishers or whoever can't split you up you know if every time narrators say we should be paid more technical people say damn right they should that way every time technical people say it the massive army that is the narrators says absolutely they should because yeah. I've had conversations at Equity where, honest to God, narrators have stood up and very pleasantly, but said, well, as far as we understand, it, it's studios th- that are ripping us off. And so I've laid out exactly what we get paid and how we get paid and how much they get paid. And I can't speak for all studios, of course, around the world. But if you look on a basic, average, honest studio, we're making maybe 2 to 3% on a book. All it takes is one extra expensive lunch. And I don't make a profit at all. And profit's not an evil word. Profit pays the bills. Of course, yeah. You know, yeah. everything up to profit is paying the exact cost of production. Profit is paying for the business costs. I used to have this argument with the BBC all the time. They say, oh, you can't make a profit on a BBC production. It's like, well, yeah, but I've, I've, you, there's no line item for my for my office rent. That comes out of profit. You know, it's not actual yeah, profit. Yeah. Anyway, boring stuff. Yeah. But if we look at why, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, all your narrators listening will will, will know this. If you're a UK narrator working on a book for a UK publisher, you get paid a UK rate, okay? Now, there is no set rates because equity in the UK is unable to negotiate en masse with the UK publishing industry because the UK publishing industry very cleverly doesn't come together as a single unit and it's against UK law for them to do so anyway. So we can't have that kind of negotiation. All equity can do is lay out a set of basic rates and guidelines and request each individual publisher stick to them or have individual agreements like they have with the BBC. But of course, no, no publisher is going to agree to that because if they did all agree, then the government could have a go at them for collective bargaining. Ah, oh, the happy, happy fun times of British union law. So you have this thing and they say, OK, you get paid whatever it is, £100 per finished hour. And you look at it and you go, but out of interest, why if I'm doing the same book for an American publisher, might I be earning... 200 or 250 pound per finished hour and the argument come back is not always but generally ah well an american audiobook sells to a much larger geographical area sells to north america many 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 more potential sales therefore our budget of production is higher okay that makes sense doesn't it if Mm. if your uk publisher only selling to let's say there's 60 million people in the uk of which maybe 50,000 buy audiobooks and you're going to be selling into that market they can afford x but hang on a second the books we record in the uk nearly always appear on us sales sites like audible.com so you're paying for a uk production for a title that's sold globally that suddenly doesn't quite make sense in terms of what narrators are being paid Mm. so you look at that and you go yeah i want to fight for narrators to be getting another 50 quid per finished hour minimum or something in line with sag after or mm. a back-end percentage, or whatever it might be. But once you get to that, it's like, well, that's fair enough. But what about the producers then? 
What about the editors? What about the proofers? Yeah, proofers. We can't make audiobooks without proofers. Any proofers listening, you are superheroes. We love you. You're amazing. No audiobook should ever be released without it being proofed. Of course it shouldn't. It has to be listened to to make sure it's fine. Mistakes happen. But they get paid so little for the amount of work mm. they put in. Yet without them, we would all look like complete and utter idiots. <laughs> and so you go to the publisher and say that, and they say, well, you just pay them more then. Well, okay, but if I pay them £5 per finished hour more, I've basically just lost my profit. Yeah. Why don't you just give me £5 per... F- and I'll pass it on. I'll write a contract that says I'll pass it on. You know, it won't suddenly just become my profit. But of course, other people might not do that. So I understand it. Yeah. So th- this is why the ACA was formed. It was formed to be a collaborative group. And not just talk about money, because money is always the boring thing that no one wants to talk about. You know, it was about getting credits. It was about coming up with a set of kind of universal guidelines, things that are helpful to people, technical specifications. Uh, one of the things I want to fight for this year, we're kind of rebooting it this year. We're, I'm looking for I'm looking for uh, people to help. If anyone wants to help, please help. Um, is like I want to I want to really drill down into some of the new technical spec, which is very boring for those of you who aren't into editing and mastering. But for example, Audible are now uh, are now pushing this Spotify style mastering spec, which mm. is basically designed for streaming audio. But it's designed for the idea that if you're listening to Spotify and you're listening to a playlist and you have twelve songs in a row, and they're all from different albums different artists different thing they might be mastered at different loudness volumes and so Mm -hmm. you might have one that's really quiet piece of really and then the next so you crank it up and you've got on your in-ear headphones so they're dangerous already and then of course the next thing crashes in with some monster riff and it's like you damage your hearing so absolutely the audio engineering society and spotify and other streamers came up with this set of mastering spec which basically balances all that up a bit so in essence you shouldn't have to turn your volume up and down unless you really like a song or really hate a song, you know? So it should protect your hearing. It's a brilliant concept. But some of the publishers like Audible are applying the same spec to audiobook mastering. But you don't listen to audiobooks the same way you listen to music. Yeah. If you, for a start, most audiobooks chapters are half an hour long minimum. They're not three and a half minutes. But who listens to one chapter of one audiobook and then randomly jumps to a chapter of another audiobook and then <laughs> random? You don't do... There's no, there's no audiobook playlists like that other than you know demos or samples so having these really aggressive heavily limited heavily mastered audiobook files just sounds terrible i'm sorry it it really does they sound horrible i I know it sounds horrible to me as a sound engineer it may not sound as terrible to you as an average listener but my job is to give you the best thing not the average thing and so i want i want us to be fighting to say to the audio engineering society and i've started the conversation i think there should be an audiobook streaming spec which has more dynamics a wider mastering range more opportunity for quiet and loud to have a distance between them that aren't squashed that aren't fighting the loudness wars because it isn't music Hmm. and then we then we can you know whenever I, i master something for particular publishers i do two versions i do the one with their ridiculous mastering spec but i have one what i call my clean spec so that if at any point in the future they will change their minds, we can go. Oh yeah, well, well we've still got yeah. the, we've got the clean masters, you know. So you can have them. You don't because once you've done this mastering and limiting, you can't undo it. Once it's squashed and yucky and mucky and bleh, that's it. You're stuck with it unless you've got a clean version. So like ooh, the amount of archive space I'm taking up at the moment, <laughs> you know, the ter- <coughs> terabytes of archive I've got is just ridiculous. But yeah. That's a very technical reason for the ACA. A lot of it is basically just to say, let's all come together and have a chat and see how we're doing and help each other out and be friendly. And, and yeah. that, that has become a real thing that we do on our clubhouse every Sunday. On, we do a thing called the Sunday Schmooze with audiobook producers, <laughs> uh, which I just love the word schmooze. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that brings, like your podcast, brings narrators and audiobook people together from around the world for a couple of hours on a Sunday evening. And we just, if, 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 even if we don't have a guest or a topic, we just buoy each other up and say, what have you been doing? Tell us about your audio books or, or yeah. how's your cat today? You know, it, it does be quite cat focused. I am the cat man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and it's, I'd really like that way of doing things because otherwise we can all be pitted against each other. And you know what? I might be fighting you for a job. Let's say other studios in London, Red Apple, SNK, uh, Loftus, uh, Heavy, um who else is there there's id audio there's 2020 
I fight them every day for work. They are my rivals. I pitch against them constantly. But you know what? I also suggest them all the time. When I can't take a job, I recommend them. Um, for some of the stuff we've been doing recently where people haven't been able to get to Croydon, I've hired them and put them in that studio. And they've done the same for me. And when we need to do retakes and a, a, and a narrator can't get back to Croydon, they pop into one of the nearest studios to them and we uh, do his favours for each other. Yeah. You know, We can fight each other for work, but we all like each other and get on with each other and try to buoy each other up and make sure that we don't want to see any of us go under. Hmm. You know, we, we will fight to make profit, but we will do it in a way where hopefully we're all representing the industry as a, as a homogenous whole, or kind of like a, and we are the studios. You know, and what I'd like to see is narrators are doing the same thing through things like Gravy for the Brain and VO Networks and uh, all the other things. Like you see, there's so much togetherness with narrators. It's really interesting. There's, there's a thing in America which they talk about endlessly on Clubhouse, uh, which is um, uh, this kind of what's the phrase that they use um i can't remember what it's called now how embarrassing uh, it's kind of like a, having a partner someone who if you're struggling if you can't get back in the booth you can't get to the next chapter um then you can ring that person up or email them or message them. it's a bit like aa you know yeah. it's like <laughs> and it on, on the on the front of it it, it seems a bit silly because it's like we well, just get in the booth and read the book what's wrong with you you know it can't be that hard but actually of course we're humans and particularly work people who work only from home. It's a very different environment to, you know, I will now get up and get on a train and go to a studio and be very professional for eight hours and I will do my thing, blah, 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 blah. You know, when you get to do it at home, it, the, the, the opportunity to prevaricate is ridiculous. You know, we all know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so actually, accountability partner, that's it, an accountability partner. And the more I've looked into it, the more I think, I really like this idea. This is really, and you notice it's other narrators. And there's no reason yeah. why they should want a, to help another narrator succeed, you know, but they do yeah. because we're all in it together. The more of us, and that comes back to that whole idea of if we all want to get paid more, if we all want more credits, more respect, more whatever, then mm. if all of us treat each other with respect and if all of us back each other up, there's nowhere for the other side to go. Because mm. there's one that's always been the problem with anything to do with acting is a well if if you go on strike we'll just find another person to go and do it you know studios if we say i can't work for you i just you've got to pay me more i've had this before with the publishers i just drew a line in the sand and they went well we're really sorry but there's this other studio who's willing to do it at that price and we we have to go with it well the accountants would tell us off if we didn't so yeah. therein lies that issue of, well if we can all kind of draw a line in the sand together um but isn't it amazing? Look, we've been talking about it forever. And this is just audiobooks. You know, we haven't even yeah. talked about audio drama and all the great stuff that they do. That could be a whole other podcast for you. I think, yeah, I think it's, I, I, I think it's amazing. I think it's because of that, that shared passion, that shared responsibility. And also, I think, you know, you're all, you are, you do have this feeling, I think, as a, you know, as a narrator myself, um, we have these, you know, you do feel that kind of shared almost friendship the kinship with other narrators because you're, you're all trying to do the same thing you're all passionate about the same thing you all care about the yeah. same thing and um to have each other's back i think is is incredibly important especially when it comes to running your business absolutely yeah. there is we can all you know when i used to run labric productions the radio company you know we were definitely constantly in competition with each other because there was only x number of opportunities at the bbc to make programs so you were literally in commissioning rounds and yeah. you wanted to get a commission and by doing so someone else didn't get a commission mm -hmm. but we still formed a trade body back in 2004 you know we came to 150 companies came together and formed a thing called the radio independence group and turned around to the bbc and said we've just seen that you've renegotiated your terms of trade with the television indies we want to do the same and they were like, oh, well, you know, none of you kind of work together and you're all kind of separate companies. So if you, just, if you don't like it, we'll go to them. Mm. Everyone just said, nope, we're, we are one. We are mm. going to force you to negotiate with us. And we did. We spent a couple of years. We renegotiated. I was, I was the head negotiator. We renegotiated the BBC Terms of Trade for independent radio production. And it was an incredible thing. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it's still going. It's changed its name to Audio UK and it's a really powerful trade group. Uh, and I'm so proud looking back on what we did and what they mm. still do to this day. Uh, they now represent audiobooks as well and, and podcasts and other things. And they're such a really useful group. But it's, to do that, we all had to sort of sit around the table and go, look, I know like last year I literally 
destroyed your commissioning opportunities by swooping it at the last second. And I know you probably absolutely hate me, but I think we've got shared things here, you know. And like everyone's like, you know what? I don't hate you. I'm a bit miffed, but yeah. that's quite impressed, really. You know, because we're all just sad creatives mm. who happen to run. This is the thing that I always find so fascinating. Outside of a couple of really big companies that can afford to have like business management levels, everyone in this industry is a small individual business person or maybe within a group of two or three. But we're also the artists, whether it be yourself as a narrator, uh, whether it be me, you know, I run and own my business, but I'm a narrator, editor, director, producer, sound designer. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You know, I have to make some art, otherwise I'll go crazy. You know, Someone <laughs> yeah. actually said to me the other day, why don't you just step back and just run the business and hire more freelancers? I don't think I could get through 24 hours if I wasn't at least <laughs> editing something, let alone writing something or narrating. I go mad. You know, I'm one of those people. Everyone yeah. listening is one of those people. The reason why Clubhouse is so popular at the moment is because it's allowed people to come together and say, I'm quite good at the narration, but I'm really struggling with the business bit. Or how do I do this? Oh, I'm really good with the business bit, but I'm not too sure about this creativity lark. Mm. We can come together and help each other with that doesn't mean that we can't be fighting each other for the actual work yeah which is a joy because there should yeah. be so much of it you know there's some percentage came out the other week that only like four percent of all published books get audio editions four percent right. now admittedly there's a lot of books that come out that would never work in audio you know technical mm. manuals and non-fiction stuff university press stuff mm. there's a lot of it and that's the sort of stuff where the ai area is kind of trying to exploit at the moment but 4%. I mean, I talk to my main pub, even talking to someone like uh, Penguin Random House, who you think, you know, they're part of Pearson, like an $8 billion company. Yeah. But they only make a certain percentage, partially because they don't think some things will sell, and partially simply just because it's too expensive. And audiobook's an expensive thing to make, as anyone who's self-published through ACX or Findaway knows. You know, it can be thousands of pounds. You know, and that's just you narrators and you heavy fees <laughs> no i'm joking it's mostly us uh but but then, then there's people like harper uh, harper audio in the uk who changed a couple of years ago to being a full audiobook company so basically they they undertook that any book they signed to print publish would get an audio edition which meant they ramped up from like 150 books a year to like 500 mm. It's a massive cost. Now, I don't feel sorry for News International in any way whatsoever. You know, it's Rupert Murdoch. Let him spend his money. But, you know, that was a massive thing for a small team of two or three people, you know, Fanula and her team, to suddenly just decide to go, this big decision to go full audio. And that was a really exciting thing for them to do. And that's meant a lot more work for people. And there's a lot of audiobook work out there for people. We just got to make sure, you know, it's paid fairly and, yeah. you know, Try to encourage those in the on the edges around the kind of Fiverr sites and places not to undercut the market. You know, you see people offering to do a full audio book on Mandy or somewhere like that for mm. for a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah, we're all desperate to get that first book, but don't undersell it. I say this all the time to people who are asked to um, home narrate and home edit and home produce, and they're like, they go, "Oh yeah, yeah, they're offering me seventy five pound per finished hour." Yeah, that should be your minimum narration rate for a for a first timer. Yeah, an average an average editor rate is forty five pound per finished hour. An average proof rate is fifteen pound per finished hour. So you, no matter what you charge as a narrator, you should at least add on sixty pounds to edit and proof. Let alone there should be a charge for your home setup, your studio, and you as producer. Hmm. So it's like actually you should be looking at at least hundred and fifty, two hundred pounds to do a home full home job. But there are publishers out there saying to people, oh, we'll give you your first opportunity, 50 quid per finished hour. It's like, do you, okay, if you take it, you take it. I will never tell someone not to make money and pay their bills. But think about that. That's mm. nutty. How much did you just spend on that MacBook Air? You know, how much did you buy that, that Rode NT1A bundle for? You know, you, you might be down 500 quid on your initial setup, let alone a booth. And, you know, literally it's just a duvet fort. You spent maybe 500 quid on your equipment. 500 quid at 50 pound per finished hour that's that's you know that's 10 hours finished book but if you've never edited before that might have oh, taken yeah, you yeah. four days to record and then 12 days to edit yeah who's paying you for those 12 days you're not narrating hmm. it's madness yeah utter madness so yeah th people need to think about these things yeah definitely i think as well when you calculate it especially if you've not done many before you don't quite 
understand how much longer a, a finished hour takes. Oh yeah, uh, you know, it's not yeah. quite it's not quite one to one, is it? <laughs> yeah, and this is this is where places like Gravy for the Brain and also the ACA, but also the VO Network and and Equity and SAG AFTRA will help you. You know, mm. just anyone listening who's getting into this at the moment for the first time, reach out and ask. Don't feel like what a publisher says to you is the going rate is the going rate just double check you know it's like like if you do commercial work and you're not sure what the usage fees are you go to someone like gravy for the brain and you look up their their usage fee and you say to the client yeah thousand pound to to do the wording is fine but the usage fee is another 500 quid now you might lose the gig but if they're a proper professional say advertising agency they might have been trying to pull a trick on you but they'll know they have the money it's there because they would have charged a full usage rate to their client so you're just going i'm a professional and it's the same here as i say okay i'm willing to what it should say it's your first one you can go okay well what it should be is this 200 pounds say to include everything but because it's my first one i realize you're taking a chance on me i'm willing on this first instance to give you a discount but it's for this first one only Hmm. so i'll take 50 quid off or something like that Hmm. and see what they say you know as long as you lay out what your pricing is any of us will happily tell you how to do that yeah you know, i don't mind and we say this every week if you're not sure reach out to us at labbrook reach out to me on twitter or come to us on the sunday schmooze reach out to grave for the brain reach out to equity people will happily share this information we won't hold on to it and pretend so that you get it wrong and you lose the job because to be fair i ain't gonna get that job <laughs> <laughs> i'd rather you get the job and do a really good job of it and be not and be warmly inclined towards me and my industry so that going forward you know you might be the next stephen fry in which case you know i want to make sure that you're representing my industry as you get bigger and bigger and bigger you know we don't want you being another stephen burkoff breaking the union breaking the strike you know we want you to be on our side so i will help you every step of the way because i never know you know it's that old rule is always be careful what you say on your way up because on the way down you never know who you're going to need to ask for a favor from you know and that's something i've always been really careful about you know don't burn bridges ask ask for advice this as you said this industry is so warm and cuddly and fluffy and wonderful and silly and cat-like you know it's it, it's awesome it's a re- it's really hard to not sound like a really stupid man going on about it and <laughs> it's like oh who knows neil he's using all those silly words again but Honestly, I've been around the radio industry since I was 13 and there are some scummy parts of it and there are some difficult parts of it and there are some hard parts of it. And the audiobook part of the UK industry Mm. is so friendly and so encouraging and so warm and inviting. There's so many resources, free resources, not just paid ones, that there's no excuse for you not to get it right, you know? Yeah. If you want to be the person who undercuts the market, eh, nothing I can do about it. But you won't be taken very seriously by the main players. That's the thing, you know. And it will be heard. It yeah. will be heard. We'll be able to hear it, not just in your performance, but in your editing and your background sound and your noise floor and your and your gapping and your mastering. We'll hear it and we'll go, mm, yeah, well, yeah, maybe use someone else. Because <laughs> that's going to live with you, you know, when you're long and gone. You know, I'm not, I have a long I've got left. I'm 48 now. So, yeah, let's say I go for another 50 years. But, you know, all that Doctor Who I've done, all those audiobooks, unless there's some purge of audiobooks suddenly down the line, you know, Putin yeah. suddenly destroys all audiobooks <laughs> or something with some special missile. It's like, they'll be there for hundreds of years after me. Isn't that a weird thing to think about? It is. Do you think about someone, maybe your next door neighbour who goes to work, or is there, they're an accountant, they're doing really important work. They're helping pe- small businesses stay afloat. But other than in some HMRC database, their name won't live on. It will live, in, live on in their kids and their families, and maybe they do great charity work. You know, I'd never want to dismiss anyone. You know, everybody is important. Everyone has an impact of some level. But potentially you and I and all our lovely listeners right now might have hundreds upon hundreds of years like like our favorite rock bands like our favorite classical musicians there will be some database somewhere with a recording with our name on it and our voice or if you're a sound designer your sound design if you're a composer your compositions that is mad i mean that is really incredible to think about isn't it it's it's really motivational to to get to show up every day and give your best Um, and and that's it but and also yeah, you know, back in one of my first jobs at Chilton Radio, there was always this sign above every 
uh, studio door, which is, you know, uh, we work in entertainment. And we do. Everything we do should be about entertaining someone. Yes, we represent the author, we represent the publisher or the client, we represent the narrator or the technical mm. team or whatever it is you feel like you want to represent today, you know. Yeah. But we are being entertaining first and foremost. So depending upon the format, depends upon how you entertain. If it's nonfiction, it may be about gravitas and, and, and sharing information. You know, if it's, a, if it's a kid's book, it might be about doing the greatest ah, big voice like that all the time. Oh, it's so exciting. You know, that kind of, you know, if it's science fiction, it might be the best monster voices you've ever heard. Mm. You know, or it might just be, and these are some of my favorite books, just a great voice telling me a story. And I, I get to uh, page 330 and I've gone, whew. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> that was all right. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Good one. Yeah, it kept me going for a few days and off we jolly well go to the next one, like a good book should. You know, mm. it gives you a little universe, you fall into it for a bit, it gives you some 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 respite from the real world and then you come back, all your books do the same thing. Or they teach you something. Or they're you know, really good for students or for, obviously, yeah. you know, we haven't talked about people who, who, who are blind and partially sighted or those with uh, learning disabilities. You know, yeah. these are really, re you know, if you ever you want to think about Am I doing something important? I've had these moments of, God, you know, my sister works in the NHS. My dad, by the time he retired had, as, as a paramedic, had saved over 10,000 lives. Wow. You know, yeah. he's yeah. a freeman of the city of London, awarded to him by the Queen's sister. You know, it's like you sit and you go, what have I done with my life compared to these people who are literally, li my uncle, my dad's brother, is to this day a working paramedic, saving lives every day, you know bit of a geezer but he still saves lives every day <laughs> you know great man to have a point with but he'll save your life and you kind of think oh every now and again it's like oh. all i do is sit in a studio and muck about with words but then i realize that well someone and, and people have reached out and gone mm. i listened to that audiobook when i was literally wanting to commit suicide i've had this message uh, something something had happened and i was about to go and I just needed to get through the night. I needed to find a way to get through and not do the thing I decided to do. And I had the thing there, the knife, the gun, the whatever. Mm. And I turned on this audiobook, and it got me through the night. And in the morning, I just had enough energy to ring up my friend or speak to my mom or talk to my boss, whoever. I can't remember what the exact story was now. Uh, and that got me through another day. And uh, when I got to the end of it and I came out of the real darkness, I looked to find out who the narrator was, who the publisher was, and who the producer was. And I just wanted to send each of you a message to say I'm still alive because of your audiobook. And it was like wow. a, the most meaningless audiobook. It was just a book, you know, chick lick yeah. beach read the chick lick. That sounds even worse. That's a very <laughs> different. That's a very different genre. Uh, <laughs> but you know, not to be dismissive. They're really. I do like a good chick lit beach read. Um, yeah. But it got them through. Or a uh, friend of a friend of a friend who's very was very very ill during covid stuck in hospital absolutely no one could see him so we sent him a load of f just free audiobooks digital audiobooks he could put on the device and just sent a message after us just saying without that I, I had no i could talk to no one i could see no one and they're all books i would never have chosen myself you know a bit of science fiction a oh. bit of horror a bit of comedy a bit of doctor who but it just kept me going and you know what to everyone listening there will be someone out there whether it's a suicidal thought whether it's someone who's just going through depression, just, I apologize. Whether it's someone going through depression, whether it's someone had a heartbreak, whether it's someone who's just lonely. I keep saying just, that sounds terribly dismissive. I do apologize. Uh, whether you're lonely, whether they're fine, happy, bouncy, but they need a bit of their own time. Maybe they're in a very tight relationship and, you know, just need 10 minutes alone. Yeah. They may just be just average, having a good old time and they just need something when they're commuting. You are changing their life with what you do whether you're the narrator, the producer, the editor, the proofer. What we put into the world is entertainment and information uh, and education, if you want to go down the old Rethian BBC motto. And you can sit back and you can go, I put something into the world that's going to potentially be there for hundreds upon hundreds of years because of digital archiving. And someone at some point is going to listen to that and it's going to help them. Or it's going to make them laugh or it's going to teach them something. Or it's just going to be an inconsequential moment that passes them by but makes them... Yeah, cool. I passed my... How many people can say that? Mm. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a bus driver, you're not changing people's lives. Of course you are. You know, if you're a street sweeper, a Tesco shelf stacker, all these jobs are important. There are no make make jobs outside of potentially politicians, you know, <laughs> but... Uh, and even them, you know, kind of need them. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but for us, I think we can get very deep inside our own minds 
about our performances and our jobs and whether they're important or whether they're, they're too important, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. what we do is important. You know, I, I have now finally come to terms, you know, through my deep depression over many years, and we've not talked about depression, but, you know, I am a sufferer of very deep depression. But, and it, it comes from self-doubt, by the way. Uh, uh, but I finally, about a year or two ago, came to an acceptance of what I've done in my life even though a lot of it is ephemeral and rather silly, hmm. is worthwhile. And I stopped comparing myself to my father and all those lives he saved. Hmm. And I stopped comparing myself to my sister and the work she does with, with, um, with, with mental health and, and other people I've known who do incredible things day in, day out. It's like, you know what, there's a place in the world for them and thank the God they're there, you know? Hmm. But... Every time you talk to them, you ask them, you know, COVID's the best example of this. What do you do to de-stress and get back to doing that job? Can you imagine how difficult it is being a paramedic? And they all say, I watched a bit of Netflix. I listened to an audio book. I listened to an album. They yeah. come to the arts. They come to us. We're yeah. their lifeline. Everything we do will help one person. If you say, you know that one thing you did helped a paramedic get back on shift and they saved a life, yeah, you're not the person who saved the life. Of course you're not. They're the amazing person that saved the life. But you help them get back into that job to save that life. Think on that. So if ever you're having a bad time, it's all the accountability stuff, Liz. But if you're having a bad time about it, if you're struggling with a book, if you're finding it hard to get into the industry, if you've been in it for as long as I have and you have your down days, and you go, oh man, this is just, just the same old, same old every day. It's like, no, 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 no. Look at that little list. It might be one book. It might be a hundred books. It might be, you know, I've done over 1600 audio books now in my career. And I can look at that and go, there are 1600 loads of old tosh, wasn't it? Or, or I can go, there's 1600 one-off opportunities. There's a minimum one-off opportunity that, that there's maybe 1600 people in the world who've had a moment of, oh, thanks. You know, yeah. that's a good way to go, I think. Yeah, you know? definitely. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's, to be honest, it's, it's not a sort of a thing that is discussed very often, which is which is strange when you think about it. It's so rife with creative, working with creative people. This, the, you know, this self-doubt of what am I doing for the world? Yeah. What am I, you know, am I living up to yeah. my, my true potential? Am I, what am I changing? What am I helping? Yeah. yeah. Um, if, you, if you do theatre, yeah. at least you know you've done okay because people are there laughing yeah. or applauding hopefully not throwing things at you you know <laughs> uh you know with audiobooks the main thing is and this goes back to your earliest question about what do producers do and i talked about being a cheerleader and the first listener is yeah. to say to that person who is on their own in no other aspect of any other form of artwork uh in terms of audio other than yeah. the occasional prince type multi-instrumentalist is there one person responsible for absolutely everything you hear yeah. audiobooks if it's a single voice read you might have i did a, a fancy book with with john banks a while back where there actually it was a series but it was a quite tight series where there's over 1500 defined characters over like six books or something and and because he's a multi-voice he did them it was crazy yeah. um and by you do not want to see my excel spreadsheet it was mad uh trying to keep it's like you can always tell on my excel spreadsheets when it when a character because it's a sort of a to z you can see if a character has been listed early in the series because it'll be very flowery it'll be like you know uh sounds a bit like spike milligan but uh tall with 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 high s's and blah 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 and like towards the end it'll be a bit of a bastard <laughs> just run out of words and like, but we know what that means at that time uh but, but you know doing that many voices is an incredible strain yeah. on someone um no no other form of art has one person responsible for all of that apart from audiobooks so that is if you want to boil it down to the core of what a producer does it's making sure that person when they look through the window at you they're having that moment of self-doubt they go oh my have I, is that voice good enough Obviously, if it's crap, you tell them. But you know, nine times out of ten, it's going to be the best thing you can do is just go, "Hey, brilliant! Thumbs up! You're brilliant! I love you! Yeah. You're awesome! You've entertained me." I put my producer hat. You know, ignore whether or not it was too loud, too quiet, technically right or wrong, distorting or any of that stuff. It's like, was it a good performance? I will be your audience. I will be the person going, "Yay! More encore! Encore!" We don't get that in audiobooks very often. And I really worry when people home record and self-produce, they're not getting any positive feedback. 
you know, if you are doing that and you use an external editor and an external proofer, do ask them just to give you a little feedback, yeah. you know, preferably make it clear to them that not just negative feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that a few times. Like, did you not like anything about what I did? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, no, we thought you were brilliant. So, but you said you wanted us to point out stuff. It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah but I was kind of fishing for compliments, basically. <laughs> but we don't get that other than once it's out and you go and look at those terrible horrible horrific audible reviews <laughs> which yeah. i say terrible horror obviously if your book's great and it's brilliant they're awesome but somehow the algorithm on audible seems to allow the one bad review to float to the top mm, yeah never understood it i don't think they understand it i flagged it numerous times over the years to the point where even when we actually did a re-recording of a book that was so negatively reviewed by someone you know someone else had done it that yeah. they came to us and asked us the publisher came and said can you just re-record the whole thing with a new narrator yeah. so we did and it was put up but for some reason the, uh, the 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 system at audible screwed up and didn't delete the old negative reviews so oh, this new right. one was out for about six months and all the negatives were up there yeah. first and then of course the newer ones were kind of floating towards the bottom and it's like does that what does, that, does it purposely put negatives first it's a very odd way of doing things but maybe that they they, they do who knows but it's i think be careful because you will go and you'll be excited and you'll want to read it and i read one a few years ago so one of the few times i've won awards as a narrator was uh for a book called rome uh sack seven sacking the history in seven sackings brilliant history of rome uh, looking at it in its seven key moments across time when it had been invaded and taken over mm -hmm. um and i've done a lot of research on how to say these italian roman words place names and i'd got in touch with this professor in rome and he'd made it very clear that well there's a difference between how a roman literally historical roman would say them and how we say them and there's even a difference between how some people in italy would say them to how we in rome would say them but let's go with kind of like the way we would say it if we're teaching yeah so I went, yeah brilliant let's go with that so i did it and you know i'm not the world's greatest with italian uh phrases but he'd recorded them and i i think i did all right yeah and it, it won this earphones award for best narration and i was like oh this is amazing and the author was really happy and the publisher was really happy and i got more work out of it so i'm bouncing along all happy mr narrator who oh, haven't i done well <laughs> and then about six months later i foolishly went to audible because i wanted to I, I was selling myself into something and I, and I wanted to get a screen capture or something yeah. and i foolishly looked and like the first review was really negative even though it had like four and a half out of five stars yeah. it's like performance one star I'm thinking, oh no and you can't not read it you have yeah, to read course, it yeah, yeah. and it was like who who it's literally one of those who produced this idiot narrator uh for his he uh, for a start he simply cannot pronounce any italian words in any semblance of correct italian uh and it just goes on and on and on and then ends with and anyway he just sounds like a child and my heart yeah. crashed and i'm like i'm gonna go i went back i listened to the whole thing again compared it to the notes i rang up this professor and asked him to listen to some bits and everyone was going no you got it right you're fine it's fine yeah. but this one is still there like i can tell you it now it's like four or five years later it's yeah. there this negative comment and it's like damn you damn that being the top why is like the one underneath which is five out of five across the board love this book really informative narrator kept me interested through. why is that not the first one yeah i don't know but so we have this problem where the little bit of feedback we do get can potentially be terribly destructive yeah. so to anyone out there who's going to be a producer director think about that make sure you're giving your person as much positivity as you can within the realms of making sure the job is done correctly of course you know there's no point hiding the fact that you've mispronounced the word mischievous for the third time <laughs> ah, this is why my pet my one of my bet noirs is mischievous people mischievous it's not mischievous yeah. there is no word spelled mischievous anywhere in the world i don't care if people say it that way if your job is to produce audiobooks and the word on the page is mischievous then you pronounce it mischievous <laughs> it doesn't matter if like a hundred influencers on instagram say mischievous <laughs> i think that is going to help a lot of people with the pronunciation like a lot more people than you would hope <laughs> <laughs> well no, and i'm not angry with anyone doing it because it has become a, a kind of normalized mispronunciation yeah. and there is this argument that 
if a word is mispronounced on a regular basis and therefore it's kind of become an urban urban mm. dictionary pronunciation shall we say yeah. you should it should be acceptable to mispronounce it when you're narrating I would say the only time you could mispronounce mischievous is if you've literally got, say, an Instagram influencer, G Generation Z, Z, whatever you want to call them, character um, speaking in street patois. In which case, maybe the author should have written it as mischievous. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. I, I remember I brought this up a few months ago, or maybe a year ago now, on Twitter with one of my... It happened again, so I kind of rant about it live as it's going on, <laughs> <laughs> hoping that the narrator doesn't see what I'm tweeting. And uh, and like the third or fourth person came back, I knew it was going to come with a, oh, who appointed you the pronunciation Nazi? And I, you know, what, he goes, uh, what was the line? It was, uh, uh, yes, that's right. He ended with, uh, uh, who, who said it's your job to tell us how to pronounce words? So I just replied, literally, it is my job. <laughs> to tell people how to pronounce words and i said my job as a producer is to make sure the word on the page is pronounced correctly and like about half an hour went past and he just kind of sneaked into the to the to the stream and went okay fair enough <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the publisher's paying me to do it's like <laughs> yeah. That's but, great. yeah anyway that's gosh great. Anything else uh, before I disappear? Yeah, I was going to say we were good. At, we we just popped over the two hour mark. Yeah, <laughs> I know, and you look as hot as I feel. <laughs> um, I do. I do just have one more thing to say, if that's okay. And then yeah, I'll, of course. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you pop off. Right, we'll do part um, two next month. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. It's been, honestly, it's been um, it's it's been just amazing talking to you. Yeah, it's just been one of the best um, opportunities for me to listen and, and to ask you questions. It's been. Oh, I'm really enjoying so, it, man. Just a quick, just a quick sneaky question. Sneak uh, away from myself. Uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed um, your audiobook blast series on YouTube. Oh, um, cool! Now, Thank you. I know you did like fifty episodes. Yeah, um, you did a lot, but I just wondered, in very annoyingly way, if there's any plans to come back with phase two. Possibly. I kind of <laughs> ran out of topics. That was the problem. So audiobook blast was this idea of like literally like a one to three minute bit of information. Uh, nearly always with me in the booth or the studio somewhere. Uh, I think a couple of them we had a guest, possibly. I can't quite remember. I think Billy might have been in a couple, or Morrison might have been in a couple, or Darwin was definitely in a few. Um, But yeah, it was like, the idea was just like, oh, if I suddenly think of a thing that's been bugging me or I think is interesting, I'll quickly knock out a a blast. (laughs) And you're right, people really like them. It, It kind of, it was the inspiration for what we did during the first wave of COVID when through the ACA we did the ABCs of audiobooks series. Yeah. So if you've not seen those, I'd highly recommend go to YouTube and put in the ABCs of audiobooks. Uh, so there's 26, obviously, uh, short three to six minute uh, information blasts, basically, like like audiobook blast, but with a different member of the community. So different narrators, producers, uh, editors all giving like a really interesting bit of information um, and then it ends with this brilliant improvised rap by this great comedian <laughs> I like, gave him 10 words and he came back and did it through cameo for me it was really good um, it's so funny and we did start a second series but then everyone stopped being in covid and got back to work so I think we only got yeah. about a half of it done and everyone was like oh I'm busy now and I couldn't be bothered <laughs> doing the rest of myself um, I would happily do what I'd say is if people listening to this have got anything they'd like to ask would, that they think would be good for a sort of short one to two minute little visual youtube thing please get in touch with johnny and he can put together a list uh and we can do it in association with your podcast so oh, you know it can, it can be you know audiobook blast series two the, the <laughs> podcast strikes back uh or something like that and um yeah i'd be very happy to i, I keep meaning to get back on on to youtube yeah. and do some new stuff uh it's been a very busy year i moved house a year ago it took me three years to do the move uh and uh it killed me so <laughs> i've been building a new life in deepest countryside of kent i've become Ooh, a kent boy nice. yeah south london yeah. becomes a kent boy yeah shock <laughs> horror um you know it's like the, the age-old story or yeah. you know south london geezer discovers there's a thing called the countryside and it's amazing uh just before he hits 50 but um <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely but i'm re-energized now um to the point where i've actually got some new kit and everything else so we can actually do lots more filming so yeah let me know if there's topic and johnny you know you must have topics this two hours we've just been speaking for uh, is endless topics so yeah give me some ideas and i'll start knocking them out and maybe you could do some with us as well Oh, I would. Love to, I will rally the troops, and I'll get my yeah. own noggin going, and I will uh, definitely. Uh, I will definitely let you know. I can tell um, you. I want to congratulate you. I know they're listening and they can't see, but I can see you. You've got your microphone hung upside down. Well done, good boy. <laughs> That's how it should be done. 
I could, but this, that would be a blast. Making sure your mic... Actually, I think there is a blast about hanging your microphone upside down and having it the right distance from your mouth. So, uh, but yes, uh, you've, got a very looks, nice, you've got a very nice one. Thank you. It looks... It, it, I'm, I'm like about six inches away, so I'm trying to trying to keep to the rules. But yeah, it looks, my, with the perception, it looks a bit... Yeah, mine probably looks like I'm literally... It's the size of my head on this Zoom call, but uh, <laughs> I am... I am uh, I'm that far away from it, really. So uh, yeah. Lord knows what it sounds like, but it sounds nice in the headphones. Um, but yes, congratulations. You've hung your microphone upside down. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, I say it us again. I'll stop saying it. Thank you so much for joining me and, and the audience, to be fair. So it was yeah, there's an us. Also, you there can't see us. them, but behind you, there's a couple of ghosts. Don't. Uh, no, they are. <laughs> they are. They've, been move- they've been moving your books around ever so slightly. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's so, definitely an us in your room. I'll t- <laughs> I tell you this. When, uh, when a friend was out working at, at, at uh, Lucas Ranch uh, doing some stuff um, and he'd known about how important Star Wars, actually much more so than Doc 2 was to my friend Pete, yeah. um, it, to the point, yeah, so Pete had just passed away and I'd sent a message to, you know, like you do, to, to Lucas going, oh, <laughs> your greatest fan ever sadly passed away. We're having his funeral in a week or so's time. I don't suppose you'd be able to send us something that I could read out to his mum and dad. And nothing, obviously nothing had turned up and everything else. So uh, as part of my speech, uh, I, I, they just released some key information about the third prequel, about Revenge of the Sith. So I was able to sort of go, you know, all the sad stuff and the personal stuff. And then like, everyone's kind of down. And, and I said, now, Pete would have done this if it was me dead. Here's some spoilers for the new Star Wars movie. And I sort of read out this stuff. And like, everyone was like laughing and thinking it was brilliant. Anyway, so years and years and years later, this friend of mine was working at Lucas Ranch and he sent me this message. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I can't believe it. We've shown around. We're about to go into the meeting. And I don't think George is going to turn up or anything, but he might, I don't know, exciting, explosion. Uh, and I kind of just messaged him back just saying, oh, yeah, if they, you get the feeling there's a ghost around the room it's probably pete because you know the, the end joke of, of his eulogy had been and uh, wherever he is now oh in fact we all know where he is now he's gone to haunt lucasfilm hasn't he you know <laughs> uh, which everyone's like yeah of course he has um anyway so like a couple of days later i get this message from him going uh uh weird thing just happened george came in uh just to give us like a like, little pep talk about what we're doing and uh, and uh it's like he sort of looked off to one side and he just nodded at someone and then said, all right, Pete. And then that was it. And then went back to the meeting. And I thought I'd let you know. And I thought, that's rubbish. You're talking absolute nonsense. So I sent this message back saying, why? He goes, no, no, no. I think it's because I, when we'd met earlier, I told him about you and your best mate and, you know, how he'd sent that message. And he was really apologetic that, you know, obviously he gets thousands of those all the time and he, they just can't reply to them. So I think he might have done it as a bit of a thing, thinking that it might be quite yeah. a nice little thing to do. I thought, well, I don't know. This sounds like a whole load of old nonsense to me. But if he had... <sighs> You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if Pete's anywhere, he would have been haunting Lucas Ranch. <laughs> so I, think, I love that. Yeah. Well. Even if you're making it up just to make me happy, you know, like, good yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh funny, old, funny old life, isn't it? But yeah, so never, yeah, never dispel the fact that there might be a ghost. You never know. <laughs> Ask if it's Pete. <laughs> <laughs> He's a cheeky chap. He's always somewhere doing something. <laughs> But listen, man, you, you've got such a great podcast. I know what you're going to be doing with the podcast for our industry. It's really important. So I'd like to thank you for doing this, oh. not just with me, but uh, and if we at Labrick or me is me or us on Sunday Schmooze can help in any way, if you and your audience ever want to get in touch and, 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 and make use of us, please feel free to. Uh, but we'd be happy to, to help promote the podcast any way we can. But also just step back yourself and think over the coming weeks as you're putting all this hard work in, what you're doing and how important it is to the industry. Because we don't have much outward-facing media for audiobooks. There's very little review. There's very little discussion. You know, there's very few awards. Uh, and even if there are, no one talks about them, <laughs> apart from us. And we talk about everything. Uh, so, you know, doing what you're doing and the, getting the guests you're going to be getting on, brilliant. Well done. It's really important work. So, you know. Thank you. That um, Be buoyed. I, I can't tell you how much that means to me. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you saying that um and, and yeah just thank you once again um for for joining us uh on the show all the relevant links to uh, social media accounts and websites and everything that's been mentioned uh, uh, can be found in the show notes below um and that just about does it for this uh, uh, this week's episode yeah so another huge huge thank you to neil uh, and a thank you as always for making us part of your day
Awesome. Happy to be here. Happy to come back. 